Well, alrighty, everybody, welcome to episode number 37, episode number 37 of Sports Cards Live. So before we get started this evening, I'm going to uh, go ahead and thank the last couple of guests that we had. Last Saturday, a week ago today, Brian Gray from Leaf Trading Cards joined me. We went almost three hours and it was three hours of action. The guy has stories. The guy has knowledge and information. So if you are interested in watching that, that video is archived on the YouTube channel for Sports Cards Live. Go check that out. I also want to thank Wednesday's guest, Steve H., who joined me. Steve is the gentleman who purchased the Sidney Crosby BGS 10 Cup ARP RPA for $125,000. That was another great conversation. We went around two hours uh, of that. And... Um, it was a great conversation, nice, chilled, relaxing conversation uh, with a collector. So check that out if you would like to as well. Again, if you haven't yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, it is Sports Cards Live. I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe and or would consider that. Coming up on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, Ken Golden from Golden Auctions will be joining. And again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. This is going to be three days before the Golden Auctions, the Golden Auctions auction ends on the Saturday, the one that includes the Mike Trout Superfractor. So that's going to be really cool. We'll talk about some of the incredible lots he has up and what the auction business is like for him. And then a week, a week from today, next Saturday, is Tony Siriani, product manager at Upper Deck. So if you're just joining, if this is your first time joining, thank you for joining Sports Cards Live. Thank you to tonight's guest, Greg Cohn from Leaf Trading Cards for bringing new viewers our way. Um, we are at almost 950 subscribers on YouTube up until right now, right now. So that's pretty cool. Getting close to a thousand. And I do have a box of Upper Deck Goodwin Champions to give away. Once we hit a thousand subscribers, I'm going to do probably do a special episode and give away the, uh, the box of Goodwin. We'll open it up on screen and then give away the hit. So be sure to stay tuned and hear, uh, hear about when I will be doing that. This is the first episode ever tonight, guys. The two, two changes for this episode. The first one is that we will be streaming live on Twitter for the very first time via Periscope. So not sure how that's going to turn out. Not sure if we're going to have any viewers that way. Oh, we do have one. I see uh, I, I see um, Mustache Mondays is out there already. Welcome to the show. Um, and then I want to mention that, again, as always, guys, questions and comments are in play. So feel free to post your questions in the comments. We will try to address as many as we possibly can. The other change we're gonna do is the view. We're gonna use a different view tonight. We're gonna use the view where we're wider screened and uh, let's see how that goes. That was Greg's call. I gave him, I left him up with the decision. So we're gonna do it that way tonight. So let's bring out tonight's guest. Again, everybody, episode number 37 of Sports Cards Live. Our guest tonight is Greg Cohn. Greg Cohn, welcome to Sports Cards Live. How are you doing tonight, buddy? I'm good, how are you? Thanks for having me. I'm good, man. I'm good. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. You're somebody who I always knew, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be able to get you on the show because you're pretty active on the Hobby Insider message boards, which I'm very active on as well. And, um, you know, we go back a, a bit of a ways. But before we get into that, let's just give a few hellos out into the crowd. Let's say hi to who is all out there. Scotty, welcome to the show as always. Ziggy, welcome to the show. Good evening to you. Paul Cashman, you missed an episode that went three hours. Well, Paul, you can always go back and uh, and catch that later. Al, welcome to the show, as always. Tim, looking forward to another great show. Thanks for doing these, Jeremy Lee. Tim, my pleasure, man. Thank you for joining. Absolute Authentics. Hello to my friends north of the border. Well, I'm north of the border, but Greg over there, I can't believe I got the direction right. Greg <laughs> is in, uh, you're in Dallas, right, Greg? That's correct. Greg is in Dallas. Brian McDonald, welcome to the show. How are you this evening? All right, so Greg. We kind of, we, I don't want to say we go way back, but, um, you know, after our chat the other day, I realized that when I was at the pack out for the cup in North Carolina at the upper deck printing facility in 2009, you were there too, doing some football stuff. And I remember I was hanging out with the hockey guys, Carvin and Josh, and there was another gentleman, I don't recall who it was. And we were, uh, you know, it was after, after the pack out, we were back at the hotel and they were kind of waving to a bunch of guys who were sitting in the lobby. And uh, I said, who are those guys? And Carvin's like, oh, those are the foot. That's the football team. They're out here too. You must have been one of the guys sitting around that table in that lobby at that time. Do you remember that? I remember being there because if it was involving football from anywhere from 2003, 2010, I would have been there if we were packing out Exquisite or another pack out product. So yeah, I, I don't remember that specific uh, moment, 
But I remember seeing Carvin being in the area that we were at the same time. There was some kind of an overlap in pack out. He could have been there for exquisite basketballs for football. I'm not quite yeah. sure. Yeah, I, I think I do remember you being there actually, at least uh, in the distance in the hotel that evening uh, in the lobby. That was it's just kind of neat, man, because you know things kind of go full circle. But you and I, we do go back somewhat. I mean, you started working for Leaf in 2013, and I've been a mainstay at the the Expo in Toronto for several years now. I believe that's the first time we would have met. Was that your first time at Expo? Would it would it have been when uh, Leaf acquired in the game from Dr. Brian Price in 2013? That would have been the first time um, when I was at Upper Deck for all those years. Obviously, Carvin handled hockey. I never attended the expo. Um, when we took over in the game, um, met Brian Price. Uh, that was my first expo. And I remember meeting you there. I think that was the year we had a big birthday party for Johnny Bauer in the game land. It was very fun. And it was my first kind of a, um, meeting into the hockey world, which was interesting. Yeah. For sure, man. For sure. Um, I I remember that in the game land uh, setup that you guys had there uh, when you first took over for uh, Brian Price in the game. And um, and now I still see you guys there. I've seen you at the Expo pretty much every year since then. We have seen you at the National. I think the last one, uh, the booth that I spent time at was pretty much right behind your guys booth. So I saw you throughout the show there. And uh, you're also you are, as I said earlier, you're a, you're an active contributor on Hobby Insider. You come on there to kind of get the, the the lay of the land and kind of see what the collectors are up to, what they're looking for, what they're talking about. So thanks always for doing that. I think that's great. And we did get some questions from there for tonight. So we'll get to them. Good. I'm going to say hello to Absolute Authentics. It was a three hour show with Brian Gray a week ago today. I, I thought it was killer too. We had a great conversation. Greg, you watched the show with Brian Gray, who happens to be your, your boss, the owner of yeah. Leaf Trading Cards. Um, did you, did you manage to stay tuned for the whole three hour show? I did. And you know, like I said, I, I, talk with Brian every day, not about that specific topic, but Brian, when he gets involved and he's passionate about something, he will, he could talk for 24 hours. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Ralphie, welcome to the show, buddy. Welcome to the show. Let's rock. Okay. Jagger uh, 68 for the win. For sure. He's Jagger is a legend. It's funny you mentioned that. I don't usually show mail days or anything on like this on the, on the show, but I have one card that just came in. It happens to be a Jagger. I'm going to show it for fun. It's a it's a 2016 Fleer Showcase. It's a Precious Metal Gems out of 50. I did This just came in the other day, so it's sitting on my desk. I figure I'll show it off. Anyway, one card. All right. So, Greg, let's let's talk let's let's get to know you a little bit. I mean, obviously you you work for Leaf now, as I said a few minutes ago, you've been there since 2013, but can you take us through sort of the trajectory of your career and even starting out from you know, your first kind of uh, introduction to sports cards uh, fr from from that point right up until starting at Leaf. And then and then we'll go dive deeper into what's happening at Leaf. Sure. Well, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, um, collected cards since I was a little kid. I remember buying, you know, mostly baseball and football. Um, hockey wasn't really part of our, you know, the San Fernando Valley back in the day, California, up until about Gretzky getting there in the late 80s. Um, ended up doing shows all over the San Fernando Valley when I was 14, 15, 16. Um, ended up opening a store in my early 20s with a partner. The store is still there, by the way. It's called Cardboard Legends in Van Nuys. Uh, and during the time I had the store, uh, Mike Phillips, who worked at Fleer at the time, he's now VP of sales at Upper Deck, he would call me now and then, get input on what we thought about some of the products at Fleer in the 90s. And then he flew me out with a bunch of st other store owners. We had a nice power off about three, four days. It was really great. Um, came back and then Upper Deck. Uh, also, once Mike Phil started working there, they uh, wanted me to come out to San Diego, which is just a short drive from the Valley, a couple hours. Um, listen to some of their upcoming products uh, and give them my opinion about stuff, which I did without problem, you know. And then about a year after that, Mike Phillips called and asked if I would be interested in coming to work for. Her upper deck and I had my store. So at first I said, no, but then I thought about it and I said, you know, I don't want to be that guy that says you're doing all this wrong and you could do this better and, and then not put my money where my mouth is. So I took him up on it. So the, my partner bought me out, went to work for upper deck and I was there for almost 10 years. Oh, wow. And then leaf came about, about 2013. So was it, uh, I mean, did you just sort of jump from Upper Deck to Leaf or was there time in between and how did it come about? Well, what, what made you kind of be, what, what made you willing to make that move? Well, sometimes it's time for a change and um, I'm sure Upper Deck probably felt the same way. <laughs> um, 
So what happened was I put out on Twitter, I said, hey, my time at Upper X come to an end. And then the first person I got, well, I got two quick messages from other companies, but the first one that called me was Brian Gray. And he said, don't, it's a, you just had a big change in your life. Don't make any decisions. Enjoy your kids for the weekend. And I'll call you on Monday. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Cause you know, people might not notice how Brian, but Brian's a very tactful um, and it was a great phone call. So I said, you're right. So I didn't make any decisions. He called me on Monday. He flew me out three days later. Um, at the time I think oh, I'll never work at leaf. I'll never work for Brian Gray. And it, we'll, we'll go into the past with him later, but, um, it was a great meeting, you know, talk about how much he wants to grow and all the stuff they have planned. And at that time, you know, purchasing in the game wasn't even on a subject yet. It was just, we're looking to do some different things. We know you've done these things at upper deck for all these years. Love to have you. And then it just kind of went from there. Very cool. So one thing led to another at that point, and you started your uh, your tenure with, with Leaf Trading Card. So, you know, we, we I have a feeling we're going to talk about Brian Gray quite a bit tonight because he is he's such a, a boisterous character. He's got a lot to say, he's, and he's got so much experience in the hobby. Um, and, you know, he can be a polarizing figure at times, let, let's face it, you know. But as as we've both said, you know, I think once you get to know him, he, uh, he you, you warm up to him a little bit. So, Let's talk a bit more about him, though, like deliberately. Um, let's hear a bit about your history with him. You mentioned just now that, you know, um, you got a call from him and you thought, oh, I'll probably never work for Lee for Brian Gray. So kind of expand on that. W what was your history with Brian Gray before you actually got that phone call? <laughs> Interesting history. So when I was at Upper Deck, um, well, I think some people know about the situation where Brian um, owned Razor. And then um, we, uh, he, he was working as a consultant also at times for Richard. Um, Richard valued Brian. Uh, Richard, Richard uh, McWilliam, McWilliam, the old owner of Upper Deck or the, the now deceased owner of Upper Deck. Correct. So Brian would come to the building now and then, you know, he'd give his input. We'd talk to him. Um, but prior to that, when Brian first started making some more mainstream products like his metal products and football products, some of it to me looked kind of similar to the stuff that we were doing. So I called him out on some of the message boards and, you know, he mentioned that he was doing a product called ultimate, um, which had the thickest cards in the history of the industry. And I kind of made fun of that, you know, kind of rotting him a little bit. And he called up upper deck, you know, to some of the up big wigs and said, Hey, you can't let this guy talk about this me online like this. You need to get rid of him." And they laughed it off. And then, um, you know, Brian started doing his, which he revolutionized basically, which is the, uh, the buyback uh repack products and that sends a shockwave through a product this guy is putting our cards on their sell sheets and this is terrible we can't allow this and i was like yeah you can't allow this that's terrible and then i thought about it so wait a minute he's doing advertising for our stuff if he feels our cards are so great that he wants to do that we already sold him why does it affect us let him do it and it kind of died down and, and look where it is now i mean he pioneered the repack products right right yeah, they're they're pretty awesome. So so again, you, you got the phone call, but before the phone call, here you are calling him out on message boards, uh, mm -hmm. and then he he notices it. He calls your boss, the bosses at Upper Deck, and says, "You can't let this guy do this. You got to get rid of him." I, he kind of tried to get you fired from your job. That's pretty. That's hilarious. And then he tries to hire you. So that that's a uh, it's an interesting turn of events, hey? Well, at, and then at the 2010 National in Baltimore, I was working for Upper Deck. And their booth was kind of close to our booth. And I remember telling someone, I think blowout through a party for a big, they were sponsoring a um, UFC fighter, I believe. And I went to the party and I said, hey, I'm going to go, you know, we've had a weird history. I'm going to go buy Brian Gray a beer. And someone told me he doesn't drink. I was like, come on. He's like, no, never, not one ounce of alcohol. And he doesn't. Brian does not drink alcohol. And I said, okay. So I saw him at a different party that night. And he came up to me and said, hey, just want well, you know, you know, I think you do a great job at Upper Deck. I think that you're products have been innovative and i think i'd love to have you come work with me at leaf one day and i'm like ah, that'll never happen brian but i'm glad we could talk and of course never say never right right exactly okay let's uh let's say hello to a few more uh, people we have watching josh packham welcome as always yeah we're gonna have a good show tonight josh i did receive one of your questions and we are ready to ask that a little in a little bit legion italia welcome as always loyal loyal viewer thank you for joining Wax Museum Podcast. Good evening to you as well. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good to have you. So, Greg, why don't you tell us a little bit about, I mean, you went from Upper Deck, a, 
a pretty big company. I don't know the head count there. It doesn't really matter, but a big company, let's say. And now you're working at Leaf, which is a smaller company, probably on something under 20 employees. It would be my guess. You could verify if you want to. How many employees? Is it less than 20? Yes, less than 20, less than 15. Less than under 15. So yeah. say between, I don't know if you're, you, if it's private, information, but between say 10 and 15 employees, right. something like that. So a real small uh, company where, you know, I, I've worked in small companies too. You almost feel like family when you're, when you're that small, because you're seeing everybody every day in the office. What, uh, can you speak a little bit to, as a guy working in, you know, for a big card company, Upper Deck and a smaller one, Leaf, what's it, what are some of the differences you've noticed uh, w- between working for the big company and the small company? What are some of the, are there more liberties you have, more freedoms? I mean, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Well, when I started at Upper Deck in 03, I think we we're over 550 employees at that time. It was massive. Um, I mean, now coming from a guy who owned a store, worked with two people, I, I was shell-shocked. Um, Leaf? You, you said 550 employees yeah. at Upper Deck in 2003? You no, know, with entertainment and overseas. And wow. Cust- it, was, it was incredible. I mean, That's a big organization. Or sports plus entertainment. It was massive. It was, you know, and it was just a whole different world. Um, and then you know, working at Leaf and working for Brian is, to me, you know, after you've been 10 years in kind of, I guess, the corporate structure and, you know, every, every idea and every this and that has to go through certain levels of approvals. Um, now it's basically just me and Brian. And if Brian, he, he gives me that freedom. He tells me, if you, if you believe in it, you think it's going to work, do it. Now, it always doesn't work. But he's the first one to tell me you've got to, you know, do your thing. And, you know, one of the things I have to do is when you're at Upper Deck in a bigger company, you know, you have a lot of people working with you. Let's say a coordinator who does checklists or this guy does this and he helps you out. Basically, the product guys there do most of the schemes and schematics and maybe some of the themes of a product. Where at Leaf, I'm doing the checklist. I'm doing the schemes, the schematics, the budgeting. Um helping pick photos sometimes, uh, packing out, hand packing every card. I go pull all the mem for the product to get ready to get cut and shipped. So it's when you're a small company, you're just not doing a f- one thing here or there. You're doing basically everything. It's like a chef who's all the ingredients right. from beginning till it's on the plate is you, which I love actually, you know, it can get, you know, it gets to touch every card. I get to pack out and see everything, you know, and a lot of times with upper deck, it's being processed somewhere else. Right. So you're not really getting to see the final job until it's on the market. Whereas at Leaf, I get to control all the little aspects of that. And that's a difference and it helps. And yes, it's like a family. I mean, it's it's just uh, different how you have, you know, a smaller company and you get interact with these people a lot more intimate and it gets you you know, trust. There's a lot of trust. And I think it shows with the amount of people we have to put out the products we do and the amount of products we do is fantastic. Right on. Yeah, for sure. You know, one thing I've worked in several companies myself. And one thing I've noticed is that every company has its own culture and they can be vastly different. And if you spend too long in one organization in your career, especially if it's at the beginning of your career, if you're, you know, just getting into the workforce, you can work somewhere for 10 years, go to a new place all of a sudden, and you're kind of not sure what's going on because it can be vastly different and you need to be adaptable to that and not expect everything to be the same. That's for sure. Just kind of a ramble there. Okay, we're going to say a few more hellos. Ernie, Rondo, welcome to Sports Cars Live tonight. This is an unknown Facebook user, but I do believe it's Stefan Perot who wants to know, Greg, serious question, who's your favorite Gordie Howe collector? And then he goes on to say, think carefully about this. That is definitely Stefan, no question. Definitely. There you go. I'm going to go click the big blue button. There you go. Yeah. Go click that big blue button, Stefan. Your name should be showing up. Maybe he's on his phone. Ayo Rhino, welcome to the show, buddy. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us this evening. So, Greg, we've talked a, a bit about Brian, but I, I do have in my notes, I want to I want to know, like, and you've I guess you've addressed it a little bit, but any more comments sort of about what is it, what is Brian Gray like as a boss? Well, the interesting story about Brian is when I did work at Upper Deck, you know a lot of the stories you heard about him were not good. He's abrasive. He, you know, he's, you know, at at Upper Deck, one of the things I like to call him was a uh, carnival barker or, you know, kind of like that. And, you know, as an employee, like, yeah, yeah, he must be that way. Even though I really never met him, you know, you're seeing him really try to bully his way into the industry. And, you know, even though he's been in the industry forever, but not as a manufacturer. And then you get to know the guy on a personal level and you think he's not really like that at all. He's, 
just a different person. He cares deeply about the industry. You know, you, you, you might not know that if you didn't deal with him every day. He cares deeply. He loves this industry. I love this industry. Um, he's, you know, a big teddy bear. You know, he is. He, I've been through him many times where his first thought is, how do we make this better for the consumer or the employer? What do we do? You know, you wouldn't have known that, by the way, people would have talked about him five, six, seven years ago, but that's not who he is. He's just this big, lovable teddy bear guy. You know, do him and I butt heads a little bit? Sometimes you have to. There's no way you can always get along perfectly. You, he, you know, he's had to look as, as a product guy. You have to be pulled, reined in a little bit sometimes because we want to use everything. We want to spend all the money. We want to do every. I want to use all the jerseys. And we had a product we were going to do called. Um, it was it's a product we were going to do on metal. It was a signature heavy base. And he looked at it and said, "Whoa, whoa, a couple of things. We don't have rookies, and sometimes it's hard to sell in a signature only without a lot of men." And while our volume is so small, using metal, which is expensive, I'm not sure about this. And I said, you know what? You're right. This just doesn't work. And he felt back because I put a lot of work on the product. But I said, <laughs> I've done products that protect where it was 100 forms or 100 sheets that were canceled. To do a product of this? No. I just use some of the themes somewhere else and move on. So it's he lets me do my thing. He is understanding of the industry as well as anybody. Um, but he trusts me to do what I want to do. And like I said, he's not who people thought he was before. I think it, he comes across that now when people see him on your show, maybe interact with the national. Cause I'll tell you what, go up to him to the national. He'll always talk to you. He'll all, he loves to talk to people, at the national, all you got to do is walk up to him. Yeah. Um, so that's who he is really compared to what people might've thought he was before. And that's who I thought he was. And I learned, you know, I love the guy. I think, you know, he's, he's just good for the industry and people may not want to realize that and believe it, but it's true. Well, you know, and this isn't this isn't an episode on let, let's boost up Brian Gray. He doesn't mean hobby, that, believe me. In the industry or in in the hobby, I mean, but it's it's cool to know that you know, especially considering your history, you worked at Upper Deck, you guys didn't see eye to eye, you actually had some conflict at, at that time, and now you work for him. You say you love him. He's a teddy bear. I think that says a lot. I think that's uh, you know that, that's information that we can kind of not having that firsthand experience with him or a lot. I mean, I've, I've, no, I've known him personally, but for people that haven't, you know, you can almost take that uh, at face value and say, okay, you know, I might think a little bit differently about this guy now based on what I'm hearing, uh, seeing him on when his appearances on sports cards live and on other uh, YouTube shows and podcasts and that, and then hearing you speak about him as well. I think that's interesting. Um, absolute authentic says 26 people watching on YouTube, hit the thumbs up. Yeah. Thank you for that. Absolute. I appreciate that guys. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit the thumbs up. That apparently helps the logarithm or something like that. I'm not even sure, but it's nice to see that number. If you haven't yet subscribed, I uh, was closing on a 950 uh, earlier today, hoping to get to a thousand very soon. As soon as we get to a thousand subscribers, I do have a box of product Goodwin champions that I'm going to open up on screen and send the hits to one or more lucky winners. We'll see how that goes and how I decide to do that, but we'll get that done soon enough. The box is just sitting up there somewhere. Maybe that's it right there, I think. Yeah, well, where is it? Yeah, it's, it's actually right. Anyway, it's up there. There it is. So we'll get that done um, eventually here. Once we hit a thousand subscribers on YouTube, I do appreciate all subscriptions. And I see we've had a lot of people kind of join in the last few minutes. So I just want to let everybody know we do have great episodes coming up. I'm going to put them on the ticker below there right now. So we're scheduled with guests pretty much through September at this point, a few holes, but I have plans for those as well. And um, yeah, I just want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, and I want to thank Greg uh, personally and Leaf Trading Cards who has retweeted about this and, and, and publicized the episode tonight. So thank you guys for bringing more viewers to Sports Cards Live. It's great to grow the subscribership and, uh, and kind of get the message out there. We're bringing great guests on a regular basis here. So thank you, Absolute, for Absolute Authentics for pointing that out. Again, hit that thumbs up, subscribe. I greatly appreciate it. Yamwax. Happy Saturday night to you, sipping tequila and talking sports cards. This is just water for me, my friend. I'm just drinking the, the, the clean stuff tonight, but uh, maybe afterwards. We will see. But enjoy your evening. Yeah, I'm great to have you as always. Okay, Greg. So let's move on now. I, I wanted to have a section of this, uh, of this episode where we did just talk about Brian Gray, and we've done that. But now let's talk more about Leaf and what's going on at LEAF. Before we do, we're going to say hi to Carlos. Going to be popping back in later on, but have a great show. Thanks, Carlos. Good to see you drop in. Thank you for that. Check out Carlos's channel, Because I'm Carlos. So I wanted to talk about what's going on at LEAF and LEAF uh, as a company uh, kind of outside of just talking about Brian Gray and more about kind of what, what, what's going on there. So 
Can you speak a little bit to kick us off on this topic about, because Leaf doesn't have any uh, sports licenses right now, not major sports anyway that I know about. So, you know, you've worked at Upper Deck where you had licenses. Now you're working at Leaf without a license. You guys do own also the brand in the game, which was a really a hockey product from uh, owned by Dr. Brian Price. Now Leaf purchased it. What are some of the, I mean, we all know, we all know the basic challenges in not having a license. The biggest one being that you, you can't use the, the NHL logos. Um, can you speak kind of to what are the, some of the differences and some of the issues that you have, uh, maybe the challenges, but also some of the freedoms that it brings you even to working without the license versus having it? Well, you hit on the, one of the hardest ones, which is no logos, because I remember the first couple of years or the first year actually I started doing the hockey products at Leaf. Um, there was a, it was a battle internally for myself because it, you can't really show a lot of action shots. You can't really show a lot of full body because, you know, hockey jerseys are, have beautiful crests and logos and emblems. And when you scrub that off, it looks like they're wearing pajamas a lot. Yeah. So uh, we, uh, I had to battle it. We did a couple of products. We showed the full body and it just looked off. You know, you could, you could find some other turn right, turn left, you know, back shots. But how many times can you use that before it becomes redundant? So we started cropping the images, you know, shoulder up, which limits your design capabilities. But it allows it to look more like you can hide the logos a little bit. That's a, a disadvantage. There's no question about that. Um, but I think we've gotten better as the years have gone on of, of showcasing those players um, in, in, in a better spotlight on the card, you know, maybe uh, cropping the photos better, um, using bigger swatches maybe to take up more of the card, which we do a lot of. Uh, now, there's also advantages to not, you know, being licensed, which is the royalties that they have to pay. That money for us goes into Legends autographs, memorabilia. We're still, you know, we, I, we talked to you about the Gordie Howe jersey Brian just got me. Uh, Leaf. <laughs> I say me. <laughs> um, and that's where we put our money. We put our money in for hockey into memorabilia, into autographs. You know, every day we're getting a, a deal. You know, today we talked with Mike Bossy's people. You know, we got, just got Curry and then Lindros. And we were able to get that money in and put autographs of those players pretty frequently. Not not rare. They're, you know, you'll, you'll see an autograph of those guys in the upcoming uh, Lumber Kings hockey quite often. And that's an advantage. We're allowed to put our money into content. And we're not giving that money to somebody else which is to me an advantage. You know, would we like to have logos? Sure. <laughs> I mean, but um, it, it, it takes away when you're doing a themed car. Let's say I'm doing a the franchise favorites in the Winnipeg and you're doing all these great players in Winnipeg, but you can't show the logo. Mm -hmm. Everyone understands those players are famous for Winnipeg, but you could do some great design elements with that logo. So that there's disadvantages. But like I said, we could put that money that would normally go to a license into memorabilia, content, signatures, all good stuff. Right. Right on. Okay, so you mentioned that Brian, you know, he went out and he bought you a Gordie Howe jersey, and he said, "Well, he bought Leaf a Gordie Howe jersey." Um, I want. Here's a question that just popped into my mind because I, I picture you walking around the office wearing this Gordie Howe jersey, you know, during office hours until the day when it comes time to cutting this thing up into small pieces to insert into into cards. Um, do, have you ever done that? Have you ever like? And and I wonder, as a collector, I don't think I would be offended. If I knew that Greg Cohen at Leaf actually put on this jersey before cutting it up, like, is there, this is a question, is there sort of a, is it a, a kind of a an, a, a no, no for the card company staff to put on these, these pieces of memorabilia before they're cut up? I mean, I've never done it. Uh, it to me, it's a little weird, you know, but, but not, not too weird. I mean, I, I wouldn't have a problem if someone said, Oh, I want to put on this Gordy Howe jersey. Uh, but to me, it's, you know, it, it's bad enough. We're cutting the sucker up, right? Although I love doing it. We get enough heat for that. Believe me yeah. still in, in people, but you know, like I've had Babe Ruth bats that got delivered to me, put in my office and I'll every now and then I'll pick it up and I'll swing it around or something. But for some reason, putting on a shirt is a little different to me, but a bat we just bought, we have over 120 bats for an upcoming product that we're doing. Um, but a Jersey. Yeah. You know, it's, it's sitting up nicely folded. I put it out in my memorabilia area in the warehouse. Um, I'm getting it ready to what I call tag it. So when I send it out to get cut, I tell them exactly what, cause I, we're not cutting a lot of it, but I want exactly what I want cut on that Jersey. If a piece of a tag, a name plate, whatever it is. So that goes straight out in the warehouse and put away. And, um, yeah, I don't want to be too, uh, you know, it's, it's like with the Vezina stuff where I went out and had to pull the other day, some of the 
um, pad buckles that we're going to put in Pearl. Uh, I just kind of keep it away from me and put it out there and get it ready when it's time to go. But no, I've, I've never personally, even at Upper Deck and all those years with all those great jerseys we had then, I never put on anything, but I've swung bats. I love the bats. All right. Swinging bats. I think, I think that's fine. Wearing a Jersey and I'm thinking about it as you're speaking through it. And I think to myself, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I think that would kind of taint the Jersey to a degree. No one would ever know about it. Right. But it would, if they did, if I knew about it, I think it would sort of taint it. Like this is a NHL or a MLB or an NBA, whatever it is game worn uniform. You know, it should remain yeah. that way and not be worn. <laughs> and whatever happened between that last game, it was worn for and you guys acquiring it. That's uh, that's something I'd, I'd rather probably not know. Absolute Authentics has a really good question. He wants to know, Greg, how long does it take to complete a new product from concept idea to sell sheet and just average it or, or you know, estimate? Well, that's where another way we're different than a larger company. Because I remember, I believe at Upper Deck, it was about an 18th month, 18 month stretch from original concept to release date. Um, from for us, from for me, from a concept, from a new product to a sell sheet, because we move pretty quick. And I'm like I said, I'm working at home a lot of times doing products. I was like, oh, I got an idea, and I'll rest my laptop. It may not be uh, more than two months. Like what product? The last sell sheet we did was in the game used sports, I believe. And um, and that's a big one. That's one of the larger products we've done in terms of amount of forms or sheets. And on, from the time I finished that product to the sell sheet, it might've been two and a half months. So it's a it's a pretty quick process. Now, after you start having them cut it and produce the cards, that's where the time comes in. But from concept to sell sheet, does not say out to be that long. Okay, well, I mean, I, I and I guess it's gonna be, it, it can just differ. You can have the concept and you can park it for two months and then come back to it, right? But I think really like from, from going into production or, or going into design or going into checklist, organization, whatever it is, like, what is the first step? You have an idea, that's step number one, but now you're going to go and actually make a set of cards. What's the next step after idea or concept? Well, if the idea or concept for a product, once I have the idea of the product, like let's say um, Lumber Kings hockey, and then I will, I'll, I'll take a yellow pad like this, which I work on all the time, which I have notes on now, which we'll go over later. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll write down the themes and schematics and, and, and how I want, you know, what these will be numbered to and who, you know, uh, fantastic franchise or in Lumber Kings, you know, Twig Six, which is the autographs. Who's going to be in the autograph list? And then I'll just go on the program we have on my laptop and I'll start building away the checklist. So, so really, it, so really from idea, now you're you're building the set. You're coming I'm up. Building. Once, if I have a concept in my head, I'm going right into that. I don't want to lose the thought. I want to be able to go in there and build the concept, build the product, build the checklist. I have a nice list on my laptop of all the memorabilia we have. Um, and the good news is all the memorabilia in the warehouse. So if I, I, I'm out there 10 times a day, oh, I got to see if I have enough Solani patch to make right. sure that I can put in this product. So I do that all day. Um, the sell sheet, the hardest part is our production team because I, I push them hard. And I say, listen, I need, the, once we have the designs from my designer, Michael Jew or Jim, um, I say, okay, I need you to put these patches in these cards and number this and that. And I need 15 cards. That's where the time comes in on a sell sheet. So because they're our, our team's working hard late in the night to get, you know, the right patch on the card, the right combo, the combo I asked for. Dual right. autograph, dual patch, what it is. And that's how the because I think our sell sheets look great. Yeah. And it helps us sell on the product. When it, like Lumber Kings, people are saying, wow, that looks beautiful. And um it's and that's gonna come out quicker than we thought, actually, because we're 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 plugging away. Small company, but we're working hard. Awesome. Okay, let's uh, let's get to a couple more comments we have. Yamwax wants he says I'd love to see a, a great portrait set. Take a look at the 1976 Topps Kareem, 76 Walter Payton, Icy Bears portrait. So there, there's an idea for you from a, a themed in terms of what the cards look like. So just portraits, right? Don't need to worry about logos if that's the case. Any comment on that? Well, we actually have a product in in place right now that will be coming out. I'm hoping near the end of the year called the Art of Sport. And it's okay. going to be all portraits and artwork and just beautiful designs and artists we've done we've worked with in the past when we had the Sport King license. So you can look for that at the end of the year. That so that's going to be art. But what about a product, a photograph, portrait, photographs type of thing? Is that something you consider? Um, as a theme and an insert in a product, sure. Or or a standalone set. Anyway, think about it. You know, it's it's yeah, an idea. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm presenting the idea. I think it's cool. Portrait cards have have a yeah. long standing history in the hobby. Okay. 
Absolute says uh, a follow up to his last question: Do you cut the whole jersey at once, or do you cut as needed for each release? Um, you know, it's funny because when we took got in the game from Brian, I noticed some of his jerseys. If he had three or four of a player, he would cut one fully to different sizes, and he'd leave some alone. I prefer cutting for the job because if you cut a jersey whole, let's say you tell me you want 400 of this size, 300 of that size, 200, now you've pigeoned yourself, hold yourself to those sizes. Right. Now, I, and it takes away from creativity. So I can say, listen, oh, now I want to do a strip size or I want to do this or that. So we cut it from, from this point as we need per job. Right. Okay, cool. Makes sense. Makes sense. Super Striker, welcome to the show, buddy. Welcome as always. This is, I don't know, I'm guessing this is Stefan again. He says, no more Cyclone Taylor. What's up, boys? Any Cyclone memorabilia in the shop these days? That's a good, well, you're never going to find anymore. What we have now, that's the last you'll ever see. And that's a story in itself because my first year I did in the game used hockey, which went was hugely popular. I, even Brian Price called me and said, hey, whoa, you got to slow down a little bit on the vintage guys because you can't replace this stuff. That's right. And I took heed. So we're still going to use those guys, but I'm going to try to keep it a little lower. In the game used hockey will come out this year in October. And all the vintage will be in there, but just lower quantities because you can't replace this. There's no, you're not going to find another Cyclone Taylor skate. You're not going to find another Vezina pad, uh, Hainsworth stuff. You, you just don't see it anywhere. Yeah. So okay. I have, and, and Brian said, hey, <laughs> slow down. I made this stuff last all these years. Don't use it all in one product. So yeah, um, there'll be Cyclone coming. Yeah. I mean, anytime you're talking about the mem the game worn memorabilia from the pioneers of the game, like the guys that played in the 1910s, 1920s. They're not making any more of that no. stuff. That's for sure. That is for sure. Uh, Super Striker wants to know, do you guys have any plans for any soccer products in the works? Soccer solo, no. We, we have a lot of soccer guys we're using in the upcoming superlative sports, which releases in about three weeks. But a standalone soccer is a little rough for us without, you know, leagues. And um, you have to go individually to each athlete. Um, you know, I think Panini has one license. Tops has the other. Uh, so it's a little difficult for us. We probably won't go into outside the, the core sports other than we'll do a wrestling product here and there. I think tennis and soccer are probably done for us, but you never know. As of right now, there aren't any plans for soccer, but we have a lot of soccer in our, you know, when we get into our multi-sport, that's a category I think Leaf now kind of owns. And we're, we have a lot of soccer coming up, not just autographs, but memorabilia in future products. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. Super Striker says, great show as always, Greg. Thank you for being a guest. Yam wants to know, has Leaf thought about jumping on esports cards? You know, to be honest, uh, uh, my dad always was a fan of saying something like stay in your lane. Right. Um, we do what we do and we think we do it well. We're a smaller company. Um, so esports, you know, we've, we've talked about things like that, but it's not really something that we're I mean, if a, if a huge esports star comes around or something like that, and we get a deal with them, we'll put them in our products. Um, Brian loves to do that. Uh, yeah. He's always coming up with, you know, out of no, out of the box thinking with athletes. But um, as of now, as a standalone, probably not. Fair enough. Thank you for answering that one. He goes on to say, picturing a game used controller piece from Ninja or Bugga, which I guess are some uh, well known esports guys. Um, we, there's a very specific question. I want to, if you can just answer this one quickly, uh, Greg, it's from AO Rhino. He wants to know, uh, in one of the Leaf Pearl products, there's a Paragon Signatures dual auto with Steph and, and Giannis. The Giannis patch on there, is it from his Greece jersey? Patch is blue. He was curious. Can you it is from his Greece jersey. It is from his Greece jersey. There you go, AO. Hope that is helpful for you to find that out this evening. Uh, comment from... Uh, Wax Museum Podcast. He says, Leaf had a pretty awesome patch database for Ewing and a few other players at one point. Any chance we can see some type of database with all of the source material, similar to what Hits Memorabilia did? Um, you mean once the cards are built? Like if we do a Ewing patch or an Ichiro patch and once the cards are built and on the market, uh, we have a, a database of all the patches we produce? Yeah, I, th I think he wants to be able to see the jersey that it originally came from type of thing. Oh, see, the issue with that is like, you know, a lot of the stuff we got from, let's say, in the game was already pre-cut. So um, uh, there wasn't much we could do with that. Uh, and as far as, let's say, a jersey we've just produced, I mean, it's something we, we've talked about. It's not a bad idea. To even, the well, even the Gordie Howe jersey that that you got, that Brian just purchased uh, recently for, for yeah, Leaf. Absolutely. Now, as far as patches go I, i've been able to tell pretty much when if, if someone alters one of our cards i'll know it pretty much because i've touched every card no maybe i'll miss but i take pictures of most of our key patches so i have that database kind of on my personal laptop but as far as uh uncut memorabilia it's not a bad idea it's something to think about 
You know, I once had an idea where it would be a, almost like a, you know, how Brian Price had, uh, um, what was his program where you build your own car? Uh, made uh, to order. Made to order. Whereas we put, not obviously not a Gordie Howe jersey, but let's say I got a nice, beautiful Martin Brodeur jersey. You'd put it on line with a bunch of grids and people could pick what patch they want from that jersey within the grid. Right. So he wants that part of the emblem, that part of the, you know, something like that. But um, yeah, I, mean, I don't think it's a bad idea at all. Okay, cool. Well, something to think about. Steve Elmore, good evening. How are you this uh, tonight? Thank you for joining. Uh, and that makes sense. That was Eli that asked about the Cyclone, of course. I should have known. I didn't know. Legion has a question regarding Leaf Pop Century. How do you come up with a checklist? Is it, avail is it availability or do you have certain celebrities in mind beforehand? We will have celebrities in mind beforehand. That's more of a Brian thing. I don't, I'm surprised he doesn't talk about that when he's on your channel. I know he talks about that, but that's that's one of his babies. Um we uh brian has some good connections into the entertainment industry where he they, they come to him and uh uh to ask if he's interested and a lot of times it's you know we'll get most of them but when big names come up brian will pay for them and you know that's how we get the Han, the, the um the harrison fords and he's had britney spears and he's had jennifer lopez those are big names yeah um so it's more of um yes it's not easy to get celebrity autographs most of them it's, it's not worth their time um, but when, but he does a, gr a great job of going out and getting these guys. And a lot of the times it's, they come to us, he'll go out to the guy that we have a couple connections and then they'll, they'll give us their, you know, once they get their sources. So it's more of a, once it comes to us and that product, by the way, releases in about early October, I think. Okay, great. There you go. Legion. Hope that helps you out. Uh, AO Rhino just wants to say thank you for answering the question about the Giannis Jersey. Uh, Wax Museum says, thanks for answering, Greg. Even if you just tweet pictures of the source jerseys as you get them, that would be cool. I think so, too. And that that would create a bit of a buzz for you, too. Hey, hey, collector. Hey, hobby. We just got this uh, particular piece of memorabilia in. No, that's going to make it into cards eventually. That would be pretty cool. I don't know if there's any, you know, any reasons not to do it. Uh, that that And there easily could be. But if there aren't, that would be pretty. I love that idea, Wax Museum. And I think uh, that'd be something to think about for you, uh, for you guys, Greg. Uh, Paul wants to tell everybody if you're showing up as a uh, as a, an anonymous Facebook user, please go to please go to um, streamyard.com slash Facebook and click the big blue button that will help us interact with you uh, much more easy. So please do that. And this is Eric. Eric, why why is in the game used so awesome? Well, because uh, Greg's behind it, probably, right, Greg? <laughs> well, I think it's just something. It's memorabilia heavy, and it's it's vintage stuff. And I think you guys will like this one that's coming out soon. When we talk about some of the themes that you guys are going to help me with. Okay, awesome. So I just put it up on the on the ticker at the bottom, guys. If you're watching and you're coming, you're 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 um, you haven't done it yet. Please go to streamyard.com/slash/facebook. It's right there on the ticker. Click the big blue button, and you only ever have to do that once. I see Tim Heacock in the room. Tim, welcome to the show. Your question, I'm going to read it, but we're going to come to it a little bit later because it's on the agenda for later. Uh, he just says, love and, well, here, let's put it up. Hey, guys, love and leaf products. Any additional insight into pearl and leaf superlative multi-sport? We're going to, you know what? Nah, let's just do it now. Greg, why don't we talk a little bit about what's different? in? Because you mentioned to me there's going to be some changes to pearl. Why don't you talk about that and speak to uh, the the superlative multi sport? Because Tim is a uh, he's got a, an extensive collection of leaf cards and in the game cards and memorabilia pieces. He loves the big unique pieces of memorabilia. So um, why don't you speak to that? Sure. Well, we'll start with the superlative multi sport because that's coming out soon. As a matter of fact, I just tweeted out a few cards on the leaf Twitter account that are awesome. The the true veils, the dual patches. I tweeted out some of the one on one superlative. Uh, patches that were about two weeks ago, the huge jumbo patches. Um, superlative multi-sport is, it's, I love the product. I mean, it's, there's so many, I mean, Brett Favre's and Aaron Rodgers and Jonas autographs, Messi autographs, Mayweather autographs, uh, Mark McGuire. I mean, it's, it, it's the gamut of sports this hits and the amazing memorabilia when people see that the dual patches I just posted on Twitter with Kobe and Shaq, Kobe and, uh, 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 Allen Iverson, um, the, uh, the, like I said, the autographs in there are tremendous. I mean, I, I mean, Pele autographs and there's so many eights and fours. There's bare, the, the, what there isn't a lot of is single autographs. Everything's a multi and four and six and eight. It's just a, such a beautiful product. And as the days go on next week, when we get more stuff in, I'll be tweeting out images of all these cards as they come in. So I look forward to that. Pearl hockey. 
Um, there's going to be some changes this year. Uh, the product went over well the first year. It's, if not the most expensive, one of the most expensive products ever produced for hockey. Um, we're, we're upping the game on the cuts a little bit. So be stronger cuts. You get a cut in every box. Um, I went through, like I said, a lot of our pads and there's going to be Vesna belt bu uh, pad buckles and saw chuck and plant buckles and um, uh, fight straps, just tons of quad fight straps. They look beautiful. Um, I, I think last I checked, there was over 70 shields I'm putting in this product. And if you know, we don't make, what do we make? Maybe 325 boxes. So um, tons of jumbo patches. I think there's over over 500 lettermen in there. Um, there is going to be some multi-sport autos in there, which I think, you know, sprinkled in a little bit. So it's not all just going to be 95% hockey, but I will put in some autographs of some cool duels, maybe Esposito, Carlton Fisk or something like that. Or um, there's some cards on there that's going to be a Montana with a Lemieux, let's say, which is really kind of a cool thing that, that the era. So it's going to be changed around a little bit this year. A lot of interesting uh, jumbo pieces and buckles and fight straps, everything you can imagine. So Pearl is going to be, Kind of a beast this year it's going to be fun and the, the base i think we're going with instead of just a single we're going to do something different with the base cards they're all dual player with two pearls on it so it'll be like the Mew yager and maybe cyclone taylor and uh lasur and something like that but something fun so it's, it's a lot different this year you'll start seeing some stuff coming out soon for that okay there you go tim hope that uh satisfies your curiosity thanks for the answer greg Let's keep going. Absolute Authentic says, so with Tops recently adding the ACL to the Tops Now program, do you see Leaf expanding Leaf Live? I mean, you'd never say never. I mean, we did some Leaf Live before. Like I said, it's um, you got to stay in your comfort zone. You know, for a company that doesn't really have a lot of licenses, um, it's kind of hard for us to go out and do something like that uh, without the leagues and uh, logos. And, and, and so we've done some. We might still do some. Never say never with Brian. Because sometimes he'll walk in and say, nope, we're back in this. And he's got an idea and we'll do it. So for me to say no, it, it wouldn't be correct. There's a chance. But right now, that's not something that we, we were so busy in trying to get all these other products out. Leaf Live at this point is going to kind of stay where it's at. Okay. Um, I'm going to come back to a question from Scott. Legion wants to thank you for his answer earlier. Appreciate it. Thank you, Legion. Absolutes, reminding everybody, if you're watching on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button. I do appreciate that, Absolute. And if you're not watching on, on YouTube... Feel free to go to YouTube and watch. You will be 10 seconds ahead as well, if that's uh, in, of interest to you. Um, okay, uh, a follow-up from Tim. Are you keeping the Magnus, the Magnum Opus inserts? Those are amazing cards. We are. And those I want to keep more of a secret, but yes, those will be back in the Leaf Pearl and hockey and multi-sport down the road. So you heard it here, but don't go telling anybody else. Okay. <laughs> Billy, welcome to the show, Billy. Great to see you. Billy says, I hope no Shanahan. She's a Shanahan collector. Maybe looking to not have to add another dozen or two cards to her want list. So, <laughs> um, Chris West says, did a, did a Hulk, I think Hulk Hogan, Dennis Rodman duo make it into the wrestling product? It did. Okay. There you the wrestling go. Wrestling product just released. There is a dual uh, Hogan Rodman autograph in there. Okay. There you, there you go, Chris West. And then Scott says, uh, back to the uh, the portrait question we had earlier, with having an artist set, does that still not allow for logo use or more specifically for me, goalie masks? Uh, it's goalie masks are tricky. Um, you know, we've done some where we've had to all a little bit, you know, kind of not make it. You have to show it from the side or uh, it can't be the exact logo. Um so yes, it, for an art set, we still can't use the logos. We, we have to make sure. But the beauty about an art set is, you could tell the artist, you know, exactly how you want to look where the logo not showing doesn't look so bad. You know, don't show a cap with a big billboard that there's nothing on it. Do a side view, do a swinging view where it's, uh, you know, Griffey with his hat backwards, maybe with the bubble. You know, you could do things with art where an image it is what it is. You can't really do anything to it. But with artwork on a set, you could you could you can have that artist do it any way you want, which will come off. I think you guys will be happy when you see it. OK, man. Thank you. So listen, before we move on and start talking about kind of, because I, I do want to give you an opportunity to speak to some of the other upcoming product releases like in the game used, Stickworks, that sort of thing. But before we do that, um, I want to, we got we got a good viewership right now. So I like to always sort of ask a challenging question or two. So I'm going to put, we're going to get into that right now. I'm just going to lay it out there, man. 
What's with all the parallels? People want to know why is there a card out of one, a card out of two, a card out of three, four, five, six, all, you know, there's very, with different color, where, where the only difference are the colors of the foil on these cards. We see people wondering about it. Some like it, some don't. It is what it is in terms of whether you like it or you're not. That's up to you. Collect what you like as always. But I want to give you the opportunity to give your reasoning and strategy, if you will, for why you guys pack so many different parallels of the same card into your products. Sure. Well, one of the reasons, and there's more than one reason, actually. And like I said, not everyone's going to like it. But I, I just do think that when you can have as many lower numbered cards as possible, it, it, it enhances the opening. Uh, the enjoyment factor there, the box opening enhancement. That's what I'm looking for. People to enjoy their experience. Um, you get a card number three. Now, yes, I've heard people say, well, you do a one of one gold and you do a one of one silver for some people. Why is that? That's usually someone like a Vesna or a Cyclone Taylor where when you're building a product on forms and let's say you have seven versions of parallels, it's not efficient to just do one guy with three and everyone else has seven. You want to fill the form space. Um, but I'd rather have a card number two, let's say 12, 7, 5, 3, 4, 2, 1, than 35, 5, and 1. Because 35, it kind of loses its value a little bit, in my opinion, at the original stage. Um, people have said to me before, instead of doing Cyclone 2, 2, 1, why not just number them to 5? I'm like, well, because that's, you can do that. But then I think people, one guy wants that 1 on 1, maybe the 2s. The if you're going to do a purple, green, and red anyway, does it really matter if one's a 1 on 1, one's a 2, one's a 4? There's still a purple and a green and a red. Right. Um, I just think it gives value to the to the product to have, you know, people because I've had a lot of people open up a case, let's say in the game you're talking and call me and say, I only got one one on one out of that product. You know, I'm like, I, I, I don't I'm probably, I don't know what to tell them, but some products you might get six. You know, people plates are one of ones. And I know there's four colors involved, but they're really the same thing. Yeah, they look the same. Um, so to me, the colors, you know, the, the foil or the PMS, which is the color. If you have a product that doesn't have foil, that's called PMS. Um, which is what Lumber Kings Hockey will have. Uh, I think it just adds to the product to be able to have lower numbered cards. And we number everything. And that's important to me because, you know, I know the good doctor got some 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 crud for, oh, you didn't number your gold one-on-ones, but how do I know there's not one? How do I know there's not five? And we'll number everything. That way, everyone, I'll tell you, we don't have anything in the building right now. We when I we number that stuff. So it's once it's in the product, it's gone. There's no... We don't have a lot of excess stuff in our building. We want it in the product. So if there's a one on one, there's one. If there's number three, there's three. It's in the product. I'll hold, like I said, I, I might hold back a card or two for customer service, but I want every, I want to be out there. It's numbered. These cards are numbered. There's nothing. I don't think I've done an unnumbered memorabilia or insert card at Leaf at all. Right. I want everything numbered, so you know there's if it's tw there's twenty there, there's twenty. There's one. There's one. But as far as the parallels go, I get both sides of it. I really do. I just personally think for most people, they enjoy pulling the lower numbered cards instead of a 35, five and one. It's a little boring. You get one, three, five, seven. You know, even if you see someone pull the number to three, there's still a two out there and a one out there and it, it keeps you going. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that uh, Dr. Brian Price, when he was at the helm of in the game, he took some crud as you put it for um, maybe there being some, especially when the vault product came out and you had all these uh, cards that, people thought were out of one or out of nine and then a couple uh, two or three more copies kind of turned up with a, a different colored uh, vault stamp in the corner um, when you say there's nothing in the building or if you make a card out of three or out of two that's all there is does that mean that there's no customer service cards available for those and they truly are and then the one of ones as well they're truly one of ones there are no extras made for future um, you know customer uh, replacements for damage or anything like that one of one is definitely not. Those go into the products. So what I'll do a lot of times is um, if a one of one, it looks damaged, I won't put it in. It'll just get tossed because obviously that's hard to replace. You'll save the mem. You'll save the mem first, of course. Well, we harvest the mem. Yeah, I have a little box with a bunch of damaged stuff and, you know, um, but as far as like customer service, yes. When a product, if I have an insert to 15 or 25, I'll pull out a random one or two from certain inserts, put it away. And if someone says, hey, I didn't get, you oh. know, when someone says they, they missed a hit in their box, um, I don't play the whole, oh, you're not telling the truth. I just send them a card. Most of them don't take that to heart, people, but, you know. So when you say if you make a card this number to 15, you're actually going to pull one of them from the pack out to use that as a replacement versus printing a 16th card to use that as a replacement. Absolutely. There's only yeah. 15. There's no, I'm not making more than, and 
I don't, I'll pull certain, you know, like I'll, and I'll build a product. If I need, let's say I need 10,000 cards, I'll build it to 10,075 maybe because I have to account for some damage, which you're going to lose 15 to 20 cards on some products to damage. And then some um, that just, they mess up the swatch. And then some where I want to put away a few here for customer service. So yeah, but no, I don't make a 16th card. If there's number to 15, there's one that, uh, very few inserts that I will pull aside. Okay, good stuff, man. No, that, that's great information. I think uh, to everybody watching, I, ho I hope you all find that valuable because these are these are great, uh, this is great information, man. Thank you for sharing it here on the show. I really do appreciate it. Uh, Carlos says, guess I came back at a good time. Great question. Thank you, Carlos. He goes on to say, I, I guess something that you said was fair. And then he says, but if everybody knows there's seven parallels, people don't really pay a premium for five or an out of three. Oftentimes you can get those cheaper than an out of 10 with more versions. And Greg, before you address that, I mean, you did mention at the beginning that a lot of it is about the product itself and the opening, the pack opening experience for the, the first consumer, the primary consumer. So just because, and I, I'm, I, I'm kind of answering for you in a way or responding for you in a way, but if I'm wrong, please jump in or, or, or correct me when I'm done speaking. But um, it, it, if the person opening the product is having that experience, it's not as much of a concern as to what's going to happen on the secondary market if they're liking that. However, I've always thought card companies need to be very aware of and really consider secondary market values. Uh, any any response to Carlos's comment? Yeah, I'm glad he asked that because there's one thing I did leave out. A lot of times in most of our products, when I build a product with seven parallels, let's say, like in the game you use sports or in the game you use hockey, the last three versions, sometimes four, will have patch. That differentiates it as well. So that gives it some extra value. But he, I mean, he's not necessarily wrong by saying that, you know, it, it it takes away a premium. But in my opinion, I just I build products like you said. We're very cognizant of the secondary market. But we also have to be cognizant for the enjoyment of this person paying that money, opening that box when he gets his five hits knowing there's because I can't tell you how many times the guys open his box and said to me, I didn't get a card numbered higher than 10. This is great. And I I, I understand that. Now, you know, everything, any company, once that person starts to load his cards on eBay or do whatever he does with them, obviously there's going to be, a, oh, this card only sold for $9. And look, it, it bothers me. When I see one of our cards that I that I, I think, wow, this is a great card. It sells for $1.95. It doesn't really happen often. Five bucks. I'm like, that card should have went for 20 I, I don't know how the whole eBay game works there, but um, opening experience to me is, is a big part of that battle. And we are cognizant of secondary market value because a lot of times if a guy doesn't sell great in an autograph, I'll tell you know the person I'm dealing with his agent or whatnot. I said, listen, we can't KP in this price because we're not getting return on it. People aren't getting you know, and I have to under let him know that we want people to get value out of it. And every box, and I hand pack every box. And believe me, there's been so many times where I've gone back and said this doesn't feel like enough value, and I'll go do some different mechanics and work it out and make it every box. So I think more than any company, Leaf is probably most concerned with people getting their value out of every box. But that's All a right. good question. Yeah, no, it is. And I, I've, all, I've often called it the breaker tax. It's the, the tax is the amount that you pay. It's the delta between what you would get for your cards on the on the secondary market versus what you paid for that box. So if you paid $100 for a box or a pack, for a pack and you get 50 on the market, you're paying a $50 breaker tax. That's the tax or the, the fee you pay to have the privilege of opening the product for the very first time and having that that, that box opening experience. So I hear what you're saying, and you're you're saying you want to deliver that experience and and really reduce the reduce that that tax, or at least give them value for that tax that they're paying if they're not going to recover their value. If this is someone who's opening it and just turning that product over, selling it on the secondary market, and not keeping any for their personal collection, those are sort of my thoughts on it. Um, anything to jump in before we move along? Um, and like you and I talked about the other day, it's, it's a tricky business because, you know, when people say I opened a box and we paid 120 and I only got 70 for it, I was expecting 150. And I'm like, name another industry where we talked about the licensee needs, wants profit, the manufacturer wants profit, the distributor wants profit, the store wants profit, and then the, the, the end consumer wants profit. That's difficult. And that's a battle we're having as a manufacturer because we can't control secondary market. We just can't. But we're well aware of it. And when our cars are selling well, I, we check and we know. And it, it gives me an idea of say, okay, this player sells great. 
or these patches so great or this insert doesn't, we're going to change based off that. But I'm about the experience of opening because I love cards. I love the opening of a box. Is the, the selling part, you know, it's tricky. Fair. Okay, man. Uh, I should let you know that your boss is now watching the show. Brian Gray has joined us. I don't know if he just joined us uh, now or earlier, but he's now, he did he did add on that the Honest Patch is from a Greece jersey. And then he goes on to say, hopefully Greg only has great things to say about Leafs visionary and extremely charismatic CEO. BG, I can tell you that uh, you're, you've been referred to as a teddy bear. I think we should see a Brian Gray as a teddy bear card come out in some sort of product at some point, maybe with a, a room for an autograph even. That would be pretty, pretty cool, I would think. I'd buy that. Um, Okay, uh, Ed the Sun makes a comment. He says, interesting, it makes me think about numbered inserts being even more rare than I previously thought. So that's pretty cool to come out of that. Um, hockey thoughts with Scott. Scott says, how easy would it be to simply rebuild a damaged card from a product? Would like to understand better the production of the parallels. I mean, uh, the quick answer to that is it's not as easy as you think because they're not just re rebuilding one card. These cards are, are part of a sheet or what they call a form. And wouldn't you need to do the whole form over again to rebuild a card from scratch or, or not? Could you do a one-off? It Well, if it's part of a product where it's on a form, it's, it's, it's very difficult to just go one card. Usually that card's damaged or something happened in the production process, that card's gone. Um, if, we, you, if the card's produced digitally where they're basically all one-offs, it's a little easier to um, reproduce a card. We just rebuilt a card for a, a gentleman that pulled a um, Sackic patch. He sent it back to me. We had it rebuilt, sent it out to him. It was great. But on a car that's in a larger product, that's on a hundred up form, as we say, sheet, it, it's, you know, it, it's part of the sheet. It's part of the process. And it's, it's difficult to go back. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Billy says, I would shy away from Shanahan to buy a, a Brian Gray teddy bear card. Leaf rocks. <laughs> Don't give me any ideas. And uh, one of the, uh, the uh, an unknown Facebook user says, Greg sits up a bit straighter when he finds out that uh, the BG's in the room. That's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> okay, we do have more comments here. I want to get to uh, Josh Packham says, so do you think more people would be attempt would attempt complete sets if they were serial numbered out of 15 instead of the lower serial numbered? Well, I mean, if you think about it, if we number a card to 15, then there's parallels to 7, 4, 3, 2, 1. You can still collect the number to 15. No, no one's stopping either. Now, if he's asking if we just did a 15 and maybe a one of one, I, I just don't know. I don't know what the sell, set builder um, mindset is for inserts and memorabilia because we don't do base cards. Um, the people I've talked to aren't generally, if they, they were collecting by player, they might see an insert. Like I know in Massman, you brought that up yesterday. Someone was collecting one of our inserts from that and loved it and they bought. But he liked the idea. He could listen. He could buy a number to 15 or a five, whatever fits his set. He wants to buy the one that looks the nicest, the most patches on it, the most color. Uh, so um, you can still buy the number to 15 and finish that set, or you could do the number five, or you could do the number to three. I think it gives people an opportunity because if the guy, um, one guy wants to do the 15, the other guy wants to do the five. He likes lower number. He likes that color on that parallel. Maybe maybe he likes red, not blue. Yeah. It's yeah. options. Yeah, no, uh, fair answer, and and not one that I, I really know the answer to either, but uh but certainly interesting. And Josh, I, I'd almost, uh, you know, encourage you to uh, do a post on Hobby Insider kind of about this with your thoughts. And I'm sure Greg will read it uh, if you want to get into more detail or even a suggestion or something. Absolute Authentic says, while most of us hate redemptions, kudos to Leaf. Your redemption program is spot on. Only criticism is after top loading. Can you put in a team bag so they don't slide out during shipping? I will make a note of that. That's not a bad point. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Hopefully that, I mean, it's a great. There's a benefit of coming on the show, Greg. You got some great ideas from some from some great hobbyists, and maybe improve the product. That would be if that's the result of this show. I'm very proud of that for sure. Um, an, an anonymous Facebook user who hasn't yet gone to Streamyard.com/slash/Facebook and hit the big blue button says, "Just logging in. So sorry if this has been asked, but any potential for an AEW wrestling release of any sort? And if so, when?" You know, it's funny. Someone else asked me that a few weeks ago. Could be um, the same guy. It could be. Um, that's something more that I talked to Brian about because uh, he he handles a lot of the connections we have or all the connections we have for wrestling. Um, wrestling is a is a more of a when he gets enough autographs and it takes time because like wrestling is like golf and these other sports where it's just not a players union where you can go out and get all these autographs. These guys are all over the place. It's hard to get them. Um, so I, as of right now, there's no plans for uh, another AEW, but that doesn't mean there won't be. Sure. Like I said, if Brian gets something in his mind, and he wants to do it, it'll get done. 
And that's the one of the benefits of being a smaller company. And even without licenses and that, there's really no one to answer to except really BG at the end of the day and then the consumer. So you guys can remain nimble and adapt and pivot quickly if, if the need arises and the opportunity arises. I think that, that's a great, a great sort of advantage that you may have over some competition. Scott yeah. says, I love parallels just for my own personal collection. It doesn't focus on autograph or game use. I'm still trying to track down the Patrick Wall mask parallels from 1617. Some of your nicest cards, I believe. Nice comment. Thank you, Scott. Bill says, as a set collector, I prefer all the cards in color parallel to have the same number. I did the 15, 16 Heroes and Prospects, all-time hockey heroes purple. Most were out of five, but some are out of three. Something to consider. I think that, that that's a fair comment as well. Oh, and hi, everyone. Well, hello. Wish I knew who you were right now. You can pop your name in another comment. That would be great. Uh, Paul wants to know, he's curious, what did, then this is going to come up. Actually, Greg, I have that on my list at the very end to talk about with you, but why don't you jump in and what do you collect? Well, it's funny because um, when you go, when I was a kid, I collected everything, but then when you own a store and you go work for manufacturers, it's kind of collecting, at least for me, it went a different direction. What I have is mostly all my seventies baseball sets and binders. Don't care what condition they're in. I'll never get them graded. That doesn't interest me. I just love cards and I've loved cards since I was a kid. So my collection is mostly seventies baseball from 71, I think to 79. And I, I had, I think I have 75, 76 football. And then I have, I collect weird stuff. Like I have probably 3000 sporting news going all the way back to the fifties sports Illustrated is from the, you know, sixties and seventies, I, you know, stuff like that sports. Cause I'm a, to me, collecting is a nostalgic thing for me, and I love it. It's, it. It reminds me of my childhood. It brings people, you know, it brings you back to something you loved. So that's where my collecting comes in. And that's why I enjoy working in this industry so much, because let's be honest, I've been doing this since I was 14 years old. Yeah. Um, it, it's just I love the idea of being able to help produce things like this um, that maybe some other kid in 20 years will say, I love these cars that Leaf did. This is, you know, why I do this. That's the enjoyable part to me. Um, but my personal collection is mostly – uh, and you'll talk to anyone that knows this. As far as my music goes and my trading cards, it's 70s. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned to me that the 70s baseball sets, that's the kind of stuff. Like, So you probably have a George Brett rookie, a Robin Young rookie, maybe a Dave Winfield rookie, all those guys from the the, the Eckersley, the Ozzy Smith, all those guys, right? The Gary like it. It's a nostalgic thing to me. So the condition doesn't matter. I just have them in sleeves. Um, I remember I showed it to someone once 10 years ago, and I think I have some that are double sided. like that how can you put two and one? Are you crazy to do it? And I'm like, oh, it's just how I like to flip and look at it, you know? Yeah. Oh, so two in the same, in the same yeah. pocket of a nine pocket page. Yeah. I literally had some of these in there since about 1983. I believe it. I believe it went well, when, when nine pocket sleeves first came out, probably. Yeah. And then they're yellow when they're old. And I've had to switch some out because they crack and you know, it's not pleasing, but I, I just, that's how I like it. All right. Uh, Fernando Gonzalez, the Lou Gonzalez says 2019 in the game used was a great card set. Are you planning to have it in 2020? We are. Um, which one hockey or uh, sports? Cause we do two of them. If it's hockey, it's going to be out around the end of October. And that's one of the ones I was going to go over some of the themes that we talked about and let them have some input hockey. And then in the game, used sports will be out, I think end of September. Okay. Thank you very much. Sean Barlow Staples Lindsay. I love these guys with four names in their name. Um, so we did already talk about this, Sean, and there are no plans for an AEW wrestling set right now, but they do remain nimble and something could come if the opportunity uh, presents itself. Uh, I don't know. You might know this next person, uh, Greg. QQ Bean Coco says, hi, dad. I know that's not my that's not my kid, so that must be your kid. That's my kid. All right. Hi, Tanner. Well, well, Tanner? Yes. Tanner, welcome to the show. Glad to have you. Happy to have your father on as well. Great guest for us tonight. Uh, Chris says something about AEW again. Their rest set has a ton of AEW guys in it. Uh, I lost that comment. Where did it go? Way up here. I like the pseudo AEW set. Great. Which one by name? Uh, okay. Howdy, Tanner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me see here. Just kind of a bunch of small comments that are not really uh, ones that we're going to uh, bring on to the show. Uh, cool collection. What is a favorite magazine cover? Asks Yam Wax. Well, that's a good question. I have some that have Jordan on it going back to you know, when he was on North Carolina. My favorite is probably God, um, the Fisk with his hands in the air in, in the 75 World Series. Um, I have the first Sports Illustrated cover with Eddie Matthews. Oh, cool. Um, that's cool. 
cool. Yeah, those are some of my favorites. But to me, like I said, it's more of a nostalgic thing. I have one with Fernando Mania on it because I grew up in the San Fernando Valley with the big Fernando Mania. That's one of my favorites. So, okay, cool. So, kind of going to leave the rest of the comments alone. I think your uh, your son Tanner was talking to one of his buddies out there who then says, "Okay, bye. <laughs> nice to have you, Alex. Thanks for joining us." He, well, he tells Alex that uh, the one on the right is my dad. I love it. Okay, so. <clears throat> We, I want to touch on this, and this is kind of going back in time a little bit, but, you know, when Leaf acquired in the game, you were, you were there, um, and that was, a, that was a big deal in, in the hobby as far as hockey collectors goes, because in the game was one of the, one of the primary hockey card uh, producers that, that exist. You know, I mean, even when, even when there were multiple licensees with Upper Deck and Panini, um, in the game was still churning away, putting out product, and had quite the quite the customer base, I would say. What can you tell us? Like, what was it like, uh, kind of that, ac that acquisition? Was it, was it a fast sort of transaction? And, um, what, what did it change about leaf? Would you say, I, I'm obviously it changed that you had all these new products and these new brands that you could build, but what else did, what, what other kind of side, side effects did it have to the company and to you in your role? Well, as far as a transaction, part that's more of a brian thing because him and, and dr price were working on that behind the scenes for a while um once it looked like it was going to happen brian and i flew out to uh his warehouse took a look at all the memorabilia which was amazing obviously if you've never you know to go through all the boxes and see the stuff he has to see his personal collection uh, that he would sometimes bring out to in the game use land um to see the, uh, the the amount of memorabilia the amount of sticks the process what they go you know because they were a small company like us so a lot of there was a lot of similarities involved when um, how the pro production process took place. So it to me it changed Leaf in that, and I've said this before to people where I think it kind of I mean Leaf was starting to grow a little bit at that time, but it really put us into the in my opinion kind of a, a little bit of the big boys game. We're, we now had memorabilia that no one else had, not even close. Um, it just so happened at the time we got in the game, Panini was out of hockey. So that kind of helped in our favor. Now, all of a sudden, there's just us in Upper Deck. And we were different than Upper Deck. There were rookies, and there were this and that, and we were legends and vintage. And it, it changed the trajectory of our company, in my opinion, because people saw us building products that were um, that looked you know, and felt and maybe reminded people of some of the great stuff that maybe a Topps or Upper Deck or, or Panini have done. It put us in that level, I think, and then we've grown from there. Um, when people hear that you've bought purchased a major company basically like that people are like oh leaf leaf just bought upper deck didn't buy them tops didn't buy them panini leaf and you know that's obviously kudos to brian because he worked through that deal and then brian came brought me in and said listen you're here and i'm glad you're working for us now because this is big um and we just put a plan together of products and like i told you yesterday um dr price and i had nice long talks about products that he did and what worked and what didn't and what needed to be redone um, what the consumer out there was looking for. Um, and it was great. I love talking to, 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 to Dr. Price because he's got knowledge. You just can't get anywhere else, especially for a company that's just getting into hockey. We needed that. And he was helpful. Yeah, he's been around for a long time. No, no doubt. So what did he, uh, was there anything he kind of warned you about or did he, what did he kind of tell you about that, that hockey consumer up in Canada at the expo? Um, in like what, any kind of tips or tidbits that he gave you, any kind of like, uh, you know, real nuggets of wisdom, because obviously like, and, and tied into that is, did you guys, did you pick up any trade secrets with that purchase that, that you've implemented across the whole company? Um, yeah. So the great talks were about the consumer because look, I, like I said, my whole time at upper deck was football and baseball. I did football and baseball there for nine years. Um, Carvin, Carvin handled hockey, um, never had to worry about it. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't my thing. I grew up in the Valley up until Gretzky got there. Hockey was a video game. Right. Um, so, uh, he, you know, I, he explained to me the hockey consumer is different. They're different. They're passionate. They will let you know what they like. They will definitely let you know what they don't like. And I learned that and, and I'm still learning that to this day. And this is seven years later, I'm still figuring out, okay, you know, uh, they don't, certain guys don't like, I remember the first, um, time we took over Lumber Kings, um, I thought I was going to get fancy and I, I'm, not, I'm sorry, um, stick work. Right. I'm going to put foil on it and this and that. And it's going to look like big time. And one of the first person to call him was Frankie Fives. 
And he said, why'd you put foil on this? The first one didn't, it was great. And um, sometimes you have to learn, you don't always have to put your own stamp on something. If it's good, don't mess with it. Yeah. And that's a lesson learned right there. Um, so now, as you see the ones we do now, Lumber Kings and Stick Work, they're going back to this nice colors and not, not a lot of foil. We save foil for the other products in the game. So that was a nice lesson learned. He, you know, he talked about products like um, uh, Brian, uh, Dr. Price and I, about, like I say, uh, that, were, that weren't working as well as they had in the past for him, like Heroes and Prospects or Between the Pipes. Um, so we turned Between the Pipes and the Mask on, which you've had a success a couple times. Um, Heroes and Prospects, obviously, without CHL doesn't work. It's just, you know, you don't have prospects, so just Heroes. Now it's a TV show. Um, so it's it. But we that's what we talked about. We talked about the consumer, what to ex, what they're going to expect. Um, I did tell them at the time. I remember that, you know, we plan on numbering most of our stuff um, just because, you know, he hadn't even started with the, the issues he had with Vault yet. But just because that's what I believe, I believe if you're going to make a one on one, I don't see why we wouldn't number it to one on one. I know you could say goals one on one, but I want to number it. And he he understood that um, different process. He. Uh, but, you know, he explained to me some of the history behind the memorabilia, talked about the Hall of Fame and how he acquired it. And uh, it was just amazing seeing his personal collection, which I'd love for him to get some of that stuff for us now. But he's holding tight. I'm still trying. Um, but it was a, it was a, just a great learning process for myself and for Brian just to know the hockey consumer is just different. And I know you, someone on your show compared the hockey consumer to the baseball. And I don't think so. I don't think there's anybody like hockey. I think hockey is different. It's its own animal. I'm learning that every day. They are passionate. The hockey consumer knows what they want. Um, you know, Jonas Enroth, there's a collector, crease collector, I believe, on the boards. Yeah. He collects Jonas Enroth. I mean, in baseball, that's like collecting. Uh, I mean, it's just you don't see that that much. But this guy's passionate. And I love that. So much so that I just I'm putting a shield of his in Pearl because I want this guy to have another card coming out. And and hopefully, uh, crease collector's name is Aaron. Hopefully, Aaron is the one that ends up uh, with that card. That would that would probably be pretty I cool. So. That's the beauty of this. And I want it always gets to me. When I, I know I can't put everyone's favorite player in this and that. I get requests all the time, but this guy and he collects someone that you wouldn't imagine. But that's hockey. That's why I love the hockey collector. They're just different. At the shows, they come up to me and they talk to me and they want to know this and they talk about these guys in the CHL and how their their their, their rise to stardom. And I love hearing that. So it's. It's a different to me. There's nothing like the hockey consumer. Nothing. The, you mentioned uh, Aaron Crease collector with uh, Jonas Enroth, the goaltender who's uh, I believe playing in Europe right now. But there's another member on Hobby Insider. I believe it's Josh Packham. He collects Nathan Horton. He asked me to ask you if there's any Nathan Horton uh, cards coming up in any upcoming products. I, I think he's asked me that before, and I do have plans to use him in a couple of upcoming products. I'm sure I'm he's out. We don't have a stick of him, so it won't be uh, Lumber Kings. But it's possible he'll be, make his way into in the game used hockey. All right, cool. Tanner says, I remember at the Upper Deck office, they had a lot of Marvel statues. And that would be because Upper Deck has that Marvel license. So yeah. uh, good memories for your boy, Tanner. Thank you for still sticking with us, oh, Tanner. It's good, to have you. <laughs> good to have you, buddy. Um, so, Greg, I want you to, you know, you mentioned that um, you grew up in the Valley. Hockey was a video game uh, up until Gretzky came there in 89 or 88, whichever year between those two that it was. Now you're making hockey products for a living. How has that transition been for you? And how much sort of uh, cramming information into your brain have you had to do since Leaf acquired in the game? I'm still cramming. Believe it. Like I, I mentioned to you yesterday is I buy, I bought a few, three or four or five different hockey books and just read about history of hockey, history of this player. Um, I went on websites. Quant Hockey is one of them. Uh, Hockeyreference.com. So I could learn, you know, eras i want to know eras i want to know who the great defensemen were like and you know so i could put a great defenseman card together who are great guys that were rivals who are you know i want to know more about hockey in terms of like in baseball it's easy for me to go build a theme because in baseball or football i know those players are intimate I, I i grew up with them i didn't grow up with that in hockey so i have to so i i'm still learning pronounce i mean there's no you, you could compare any other sport you can't compare it to pronouncing hockey names it's you know it's a different animal and they get mad. I've, I've, I've talked to someone before. Like, Who would I tell you yesterday? I think I called him Gia Komen for the first three months. And finally someone said, Jockerman, Jockerman, just yelling. I'm like, oh, sorry, sorry. You know, but it's, it's that passion that I love. But I'm still, I love reading hockey books because you read about the, you know, I read a book about how hockey kind of came into its own right after, I mean, the new era of hockey, right after the expansion. Uh, so the 70s hockey era where the, where the Flyers became dominant and then the Islanders became, you know, you have these, these dynasties that just kept building on top of each other. Montreal to, to 
to the Islanders and the Islanders to Edmonton. I love that stuff. And I love building cards like I did in last that's in the game. Um, cup dream matchups, 76 Montreal versus 84 Edmonton, you know, without to put four guys from each card. That's why I want to learn hockey so I can figure out ways to build themes that are that resonate with the collector. Not always easy, but that's why I love it's it's still it's still a battle, it's still a challenge. And I'm and I'll always like when we go over this hockey redraft insert. Um, I think that's a fun theme. Um, obviously it's to who I have memorabilia of, but um that's where I love to get input because I can say, okay, in my opinion, this guy should have been dropped to this guy, but 900 people smarter than me in hockey will say, no, 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 no. That's well, not funny. You mentioned, you mentioned the player, uh, you, G or however you said it, Giacomen or Giacomen, whatever, you know, it, his name, it's, it, it, that's how it looks like it would sound. It's like yeah. GIA, G I A G C O M A N or whatever. Right. Um, and that's a relatively easy one. Actually, if you think of the, where, where the hockey players all come from, cause they come from, Finland, Sweden, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Russia, tons from Russia, never mind Canada and the US, of course. So whereas with baseball, you know, a lot of the names of the um, the the players that are not from the United States, it's like a Martinez or a Dominguez or a name that you've seen before from another player with the same right. name. So it's pretty easy to know how to pronounce their name again because there's not a ton of variety as there is in hockey where you've got players like, how do you how do you say this? I mean, there's there was a guy named I mean, his name was N I N I N I M A A or something like Yanni Ninima. Like, how, how do you say that? So anyway, I I just looking in the warehouse here, Dan, I looked through a uh, Afina Gwen, Afina jersey. Afina Genov, yeah. And I'm like, okay, this is great. You know, Tevardovsky from the Duck. <laughs> yeah. You know? And I'm like, these. And the great part about these guys is you get so many letters. That's why I can have so many letters in Pearl and these other sports because these names have 12, 15 letters on the back of the jersey. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay, right on. Austin Olson says, good evening, guys. It's been a while since I made it to a live stream. Yes, Austin, we have missed you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Good to have you back. Josh is happy to hear that you do plan on doing some Nathan Horton stuff. And Absolute Authentic says you should give away a chance to collaborate on a set. That would be cool. Hit the thumbs up button. I, I love it, Absolute. He's always reminding. If you're watching on YouTube, guys, please do hit the thumbs up button. Please subscribe if you haven't. As I mentioned earlier, before the show started, the, the Sports Cards Live channel was at like 940-something subscribers, getting really close to 1,000, which is obviously a big milestone for the channel and for this show. And when we get there, I'm going to open up a box of Goodwin Champions and give it away to viewers. So uh, please please uh, do all that. Please subscribe and keep on joining us. That would be great. Really do appreciate it. Uh, Austin says people got Pedersen's name. Yeah, Pedersen, Peterson. How do you say that? There's one, right? <laughs> Brian Gray wants to collaborate on a set. BG, you have final say on all this stuff, I think. So collaborate on a set. They don't have to win anything or enter anything. Just email me, Greg at leaftradingcards.com. Go to my Twitter. Go to the Leaf one. If you have an idea, let me know. Greg, yeah, you know what? And I'll mention also, guys, that uh, you know Greg and Brian Gray as well. They're pretty active members on the hobby insider message boards, which I'm the lead administrator on. So feel free to, if you haven't yet join, it's hobbyinsider.net. Feel free to join. And, um, you know, you can always post question there. Greg is on there answering questions. I mean, you probably log on to that site every day, Greg, is that fair to say? It's every day, every day. See what the collectors are talking about. Here's a great suggestion from Brian Gray. He says, Oh, he says, let's do a zoom call with collectors next week, Greg. So, now you guys just got to figure out who those are. Then he, Jeremy want to help us put together a focus group. And then he spells my name right. Um, I mean, hey, you know, it's pretty easy for you guys to put together a focus group just based on how out there you're on the show right now. You're both on the show. Brian, you've been on it twice. Greg, you're on it tonight for the first time. And, uh, you know, it'd be pretty easy to do that. So maybe you can do that through the Hobby Insider message boards. That may be a good way to, to do that. <laughs> Chris West says, my favorite hockey name is Maxime Belmochnik. I remember that player for sure. Slobs Baseball Collecting, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining. And Jay Myers says, what about Miroslav Satan? I mean, people call him Satan because his name is spelt like Satan, but it was pronounced, I think it was pronounced Shatan. So Miroslav Shatan. Absolute Authentics wants to get in on this Zoom uh, focus group, uh, BG and Greg. So Absolute. Uh, reach out, reach out to Greg or Brian on their Twitter accounts, and I'm sure they will uh, they will get back to you. But 
Greg, you did mention talking about the redraft topic. That's something that you're looking at doing. Why don't you explain to the viewers what your idea is for the redraft set and maybe get some feedback right here? Okay, well, I, the first one will come out. That's a baseball, football, basketball one that's going to be in uh, in the game use sports. In hockey, I decided let's try that in hockey. We have mem. It's, it's based off what we have mem of, but so I started the idea of wouldn't it be cool to do an insert where you list them in order and say if the if we knew then what we know now, how would the draft look? Kind of a fun thing. So myself, not knowing hockey history deep into that era, some of these, uh, who would this would this player? So I have notes. So let's say we go back to 1980 draft. And the way I listed it was in order, number one would have been Coffee, two Curry, three Dennis Savard, mm -hmm. four Larry Murphy, five Bernie Nichols, and six Steve Larmer. If someone thinks that order should be different, should Curry be ahead of Coffee? Send me a message. If, if, if you convince me, I'll do it. If you think that Savard should be ahead of one of those two guys, I just thought coffee because he's a generational kind of defenseman should be number one, but Curry 150 points like one year and you know, Gretzky's lineman, maybe he should have gone number one. So right now I have it as coffee one Curry two. Now that's not how the draft was off. You know, there's another 84. I redid it where Lemieux one, Wa two, Hall three, Robitaille four, Muller five and Gary Roberts six. Does someone think Wa should have gone ahead of Lemieux? It's possible. I can see an argument for uh, for Gary Roberts ahead of who did you have fourth there? Uh, Robitaille. No, sorry, the uh, Muller again. Muller was fifth. Muller. I can see people arguing for that. There you go. See now, I'll put a little arrow. Yeah. <laughs> and do that. You know, then there's the eighty-three Hassock over Iserman. Well, just before you go on an eighty-three, Paul has Curry ahead of Coffee, but I mean, again, these are just you know. I and, only got a bunch of input because. If but Agreement. I'll put Curry ahead of coffee. And this is, it's a fun exercise, but it's a fun exercise and not to, to change the way you approach it, but it's important to remember that when these drafts took place originally, you know, if you're choosing between Curry and coffee, one's a defenseman, one's a winger, you know, maybe the team needed the winger. So they took the winger, but if they needed the defenseman, they would have taken the defenseman, even though a lot of teams just draft under the philosophy of pick the best player best available player. at the time. Right. But and that's how I thought about this best player available. So, you know, when you look at some of these years, we'll go over more. Um, that's the one I struggle with. Is it curry or coffee? Coffee or curry? To me, it's a tough one. Um, you've got years like 88. I moved it where Solani won, Madonna two. Does Madonna still ahead of Solani in a redraft? No, Solani's ahead of Madonna. I right. would. So, and then third, um, I know, but... Rob Blake was in that draft. I have him third. I have ahead of uh, uh, Ronick and McGilney. Uh, yeah. Blake, but... I mean, the Hall of Famer. Big defenseman, McGilney. McGilney was uh, an electric player. And uh, who was the other one in the middle there? Uh, Roenick. Roenick. And McGilney and Roenick aren't in the hall, I believe. So Correct. My process was if Blake is, it's hard for me to put them above a Hall of Famer. If yeah. I'm wrong, tell me. You no, know, you, you know what? Some of these, there's no right answer. It's going to just come down to personal preference, personal bias. You know, like I, I'm taking Solani ahead of Madano all the time, but Carlos from the Because I'm Carlos channel is going to pick Madano because I know he collects Madano. He shows his mail right. on his channel all the time. So, um, and Scott goes on to say that McGillney should be in the Hockey Hall of Fame. And I think he should be. He, you know, when Solani had, when Solani broke and set the rookie scoring record in 1993 with 76 goals. There were two players that led, I believe, the league that year in goals at 76. It was Timo Solani and Alexander McGillney. So, you know, McG McGillney, he's had big years, big seasons. He's, he was a great player. He was a goal scorer. He was, he was a, a great player. So, and he had some great seasons with Pat LaFontaine, which is, you know, a great kind of pairing right there. But I love the idea. I love the idea of going back and redrafting these players on a, you know, best player at the time or best available kind of uh, basis versus what do you need? Cause who knows what, what you need? Um, so that's pretty, that's, that's a great idea. Anything else on that, Greg? Well, you no, know, that's just, so if anyone has ideas, like I said, the, the Hassock, your Hassock over Iserman, then Neely, then LaFontaine, Barrasso. And then I have to put a Claude Lemieux because the only other guy from that draft I have memorabilia. Right. Right. I mean, I want a couple of cups, right? So, yeah. um, but is Hassock over Iserman? Don't you always have to put a generational goalie? For Iserman, I mean, Iserman's a legend too. That's one where do you need a goalie? I don't know. I don't know how you, man, well, that's, that's a tough a one. Great goal goal time. What, what do you guys think out there in, in the viewers? Like post in the comments, Hasek or Iserman? Who's the, uh, who's the first pick overall if you're to redraft it? Um, 83 draft. 
What's that? That was the 83 draft. 83. And Hasek's rookie card is 1990, by the way. No, no, 91. It's 91, 92. So like eight years later, he gets his card. Um, Carlos says, you're technically not wrong, but how dare you? How dare you? Because he's a big Madano fan. I'm a big Solani fan. And guys, if you're if you're viewing and you're not familiar with Carlos's uh, YouTube channel, it's called Because I'm Carlos. You can see it there on the screen. Check it out. He does some awesome hobby rambling episodes. He does mail days. Uh, check that out for sure. Give him a subscribe if you'd be so kind. Um, okay, what does Absolute say? I'm going to kind of go out. Oh, before we do that, Brian Gray, Stevie Y. Hasek. Austin Olson says... Iserman first, Brian Gray, Iserman first, Al G, Iserman ahead is Hasek. Tim Marin says Hasek, but I live in Buffalo. Ernie says ha uh, Iserman. So more votes for Iserman so far. I'll hard, it. Man, it's it's hard to hard to dispute that. What does Scott say? He says, if you say Hasek over Iserman, how can you take Lemieux over Patrick Waugh? I'll explain that. And I thought about that because I was hoping that would come up. So my reasoning for that one is, as much as Waz is considered one of the top, I don't know, five goalies of all time, yeah. there's people that will say Lemieux was the greatest player of all time for a good stretch. True. Whereas you can't say that about Eisenman. Eisenman is a great player as he was, was never considered the, was he ever a stretch considered the best player in hockey? Never, because he always played in the era of Gretzky and Lemieux. And, but Hasek was considered for a nice stretch the best goalie in the league. He was. I, I personally, Personally, for me, Greg, I think he's the best of all time. If you just look at him from a, a technical and a skill perspective, I think he's the best there's ever been. I mean, I never saw Sawchuk play or Vezina play or Hainsworth or Bauer, those guys. But the guys I've seen watching on TV, I, I take Hasek all day long as my best goalie of all time. That's how I explain how I came up with that is because you've got two guys there, Lemieux and Hasek, that have been considered the greatest at their positions of all time. Walk has two, I guess, but something about Lemieux where he was just – like Gretzky scoring 180 points and just crazy stuff. And, but Hasek, I looked at his stats. There was about a five year stretch. Where I don't think anyone can match it. No, no, he was, uh, but you know, no one's wrong in these. I, I am going to move Heiserman up, even though it's against my better judgment because he got more votes and you guys know better than I do with this. Well, I think that's good move. I, I, I think it's, I think, you know, even though I think Hasek's probably the best goalie that ever played, I don't know that he's the, the, well, so in a draft, I might take him ahead of Iserman. I mean, it's it's, but he was he was a little, um, I don't want to say cuckoo, but he was he was a, you know, goaltenders are known for having their unique ways about them, and he certainly had his unique ways about himself. But man, could he ever could he ever play? Carlos says both are great, but Iserman in Buffalo probably doesn't get to the Cup final, but Hasek on Detroit might have if he had similar team outside of Iserman. Interesting thought experiment for sure, for sure. Uh, Scott says top five. He's thinking top two in terms of Patrick. I think he's talking about Patrick Waugh. He must be. He's a big Waugh fan. And I think I think it does come down to uh, Patrick Waugh or or Dominic Hasek for the best goalie of all time. Paul says Patrick Waugh. The one time he plays for Team Canada, we lose to Hasek. Interesting comment. Interesting comment. Scott says, how dare you guys? I love it. Chris says, Hasek is better. One more Vezinas with Brodeur and Waugh in the league while playing for a worse team. That goes to what I was saying to me. He's the best uh, goalie to ever play, but uh, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into a debate with the Wa guys because it's so close right. and it's so close, you know. Like, so okay, good stuff though. Great question, great interaction, guys. Thanks everybody for uh, putting their their votes out there and their comments. Really enjoy that. That's awesome. Okay, man, we're we're coming up. We're we're just past the hour and a half mark, so we can start to start to wind down. But there's still a few more topics I wanna I wanna talk about. So I'm just gonna as I'm as I'm just talking to fill in the time right now as I scan my list of uh, of my notes. Um, you know, a couple of the other topics we had here, Greg. One was you know how have you grown in as a professional in the sports card uh, you know product development world since you left upper deck and moved over to leaf in 2013. Is that something you can kind of speak to? Sure. You know, when I first got to upper deck, I was probably a little more combative. You know, I, I had all these ideas in my head and I wasn't willing to take a lot of outside input, so to speak. Um, I, so in that regard now is I, I I'll take input. I could take, you know, no one likes taking criticism, but I think I'm better at it now. Um, I've, Getting into hockey has helped me grow because, you know, I was dealing with two sports that I knew pretty well, 
then all of a sudden you're taken out of your comfort zone and you said, hey, you got to do the hockey and you got to figure this out quick. That helps me grow because I enjoy I enjoy research for sports because who I mean, if you love sports, who doesn't love research? So I love to go look about like we talk about just this whole thing. We just talked about the last 20 minutes. Um, when I was at Upper Deck, you would never have heard me even think about mentioning who's better, Hasek or Wah or Iserman or who's the draft because it just wasn't hockey wasn't my thing. So once I started talking about it and hearing the passion of hockey collectors, it helped me grow in that regard, uh, more well-rounded. Um, it, it, I think that I'm, I'm going to leaf now where I'm involved in more things at Upper Deck when you build a product. And Panini now, I'm sure, you come up with the ideas and concepts and then someone else is kind of doing the checklist. It helped me to do all the checklists because it helps me learn about the players. Does this guy make sense in here? Does this guy make sense? Um, it helps me learn about... Uh, just in general, things I, I, I handle more like with memorabilia and hand collating every product. We only really did the exquisites and the cups there. So it helps me get an idea of, you know, the consumer. I want to make sure this consumer gets. So I've grown in the sense that I want consumers to, it's the first thing. And Brian, that when I first got there, one of the things we talked about before was you didn't realize about Brian, if you didn't know him, is he actually cares about the consumer and about their the value in a product and a proposition. And if, I, if he gets a call and says a product isn't good, he takes it personal. He, does, he wants to make sure there's value in there. So in that regard, I have. I've done. I'm. I'm I guess I've got more more um, pots on the stove, so to speak, which helps. That's cool, man. That, that's good to know. I mean, you mentioned you become maybe less combative, and I think that's a, a great a great uh, kind of improvement to yourself. As you, you know, we're always trying to better ourselves as humans. I would say, and that's a great way to better yourself, especially coming into the very finicky hockey market where the customer can be brutally honest with you sometimes if they don't like something. And we've seen it on the Hobby Insider message boards as well as other places. And I've been impressed with your, I've been impressed with your responses, your, your level kind of just your, your level demeanor uh, throughout and uh, the way you've um, represented yourself just through text has been great because I could tell you if it was me, sometimes I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been so friendly. Um, and sometimes I'm not always so friendly, but you know, it's. Uh, I thought you've handled yourself really well, and and I. So I'm glad you mentioned that because I I can just basically corroborate what you're saying. I've noticed that myself. You have gotten a lot, um, not a lot, but you you certainly do represent yourself well on the boards. I would say, Duncanino. I just want to say good evening to you as well. Thank you for joining. Brian Gray says, Greg, tell them I scrapped a product recently out of concern for value. What what can you tell us about that, Greg? We I brought that up earlier. Remember, I mentioned the product that was going to be all on metal. Yep. And that Brian, you know, and I said, product guys have to be reined in sometimes. We sometimes have to be said, you know what? And it was a product that I wanted something different for Leaf, which is a, you know, metal look and die cuts and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, hockey products for us that are signature heavy based aren't successful because, you know, without memorabilia. And for our low volumes, metal is expensive. It just is expensive technology. And it just didn't make sense, not just financially, but for the consumer, because the value proposition, it would have had to have been an expensive product, would not have been there. And um, I had my my goggles on of, this is different die cuts. We're the, the big boys now. And, you know, and it's just sometimes you have to be reined in. And it happened to me. And Brian felt bad because I put a lot of work into the product. And he said, I feel terrible. You know, you, I, but I told him, listen, this is two, three forms. And at Upper Deck, I had a product. I can't remember the name of the product. But it was like 160 forms. I worked on it for like till midnight every night, and we lost the license and it got scrapped. Oh. So things happen. But yes, it, you know it's funny because when you were talking about before, when I left up when I left Upper Deck, someone at Upper Deck called me and said, "Hey, they just talked. We just had a meeting about you going to Leaf," and they said in the meeting, "Well, great." Brian Gray and Greg Cohn. Steinbrenner's got his Billy Martin now, but we'll see. We know how that ends. Because they were expecting us to implode together, right? Because you know, both kind of, you know, and it didn't obviously it hasn't worked out that way. Because that's what I said. They don't know when you when you don't know someone, all you know by is what you're told and what you're supposed to be told. You don't know. Well, you know, I you hear a lot of times collectors um, they speak out about the card companies as putting out a product as a cash grab. Oh, this is just a cash grab. They're just jamming autographs in there, trying to get rid of old stickers. It's a cash grab. The fact that that uh, you guys and Brian was willing to to scrap a product that had already been kind of formulated uh, because, as he says right here, he wasn't confident in the value proposition. Uh, to me, that's the exact opposite of a cash grab. You're actually losing money. You've lost you've lost resources there. Your time. I mean, you're paid for your time uh, in the interest of the customer. I think that that that's a 
it's a, it's a big a big piece of information I would say to come out of this episode right there. I think that's awesome information. Um, I, oh, I want to kind of off topic if I may, but to all the viewers out there, guys, you may have noticed tonight, and I said it earlier on, but I know a lot of you joined kind of later that we're we're experimenting with a different view here on the show. So you can see up above, we got some of the logo showing, we got some of the logo below. You get the wider angle. I'll show you what it would look like. The way I usually run the show is in this view right here. But I changed it for this show because with Greg, we talked before we went live and I said, hey man, you know, I like the other view a lot because it just adds a bit of pizzazz to the screen, but this one gives more, you know, we're up closer, you can see us better, which I like as well. So I wanna know from you guys, what do you guys prefer? Do you prefer this view here where we're taking up the whole screen or do you prefer this view here where you get the wide angle on us, the shorter kind of rise, but then you get the a bit of the pizzazz uh, around this, around our, our squares or our rectangle screens there. Let me know in the comments if you don't mind. I'd love to kind of nail this down and decide if I'm going to stick with one over the other moving forward or if we just go back and forth uh, alternating over future episodes. Thank you. Oh, Scott says the wide angle has been nice. Wax Museum, wide angle and logo looks really nice. Paul, wide angle. Obviously, Carlos says, obviously I use it myself, so I'm biased, but I think the wide angle is a better image for the stream. Legion says, wide for me. Billy, I thought I saw a comment. There it is. Billy says, wide. Chris said, okay, okay. Well, it's like it's it's unanimous, basically. It's <laughs> Okay, Absolute has a really important question. He wants to know, Greg, how does Brian look in Madonna's coat? Haven't seen the coat yet. I'm not sure he has it. He mentioned it to me, but he, I don't know if he's gotten it yet. I have seen him wear the coat a couple of times. I have to have a picture on my phone when he wore the, uh, from what was that motorcycle show that was popular like five years ago? Oh, I'm not sure, man. Oh, oh, the one with uh, with Peg Bundy in it. Yes, yes. I, I he got a jacket from the set of that, and he was where he used to wear that around a lot. That's great, but I've never seen him wear the Madonna jacket yet. Maybe it hasn't come. He just Brian. This, by the way, if you don't know what we're talking about here, guys, when Brian was on the show last time, he mentioned that he had won in one of those. Um, I forget what the what that charitable um, the fanatics, the fanatics, the, the fanatics charity that they did for during COVID. Um, he won the Madonna coat. So we were making fun of him. We want to see him wear that thing. That oh, Sons of Sons of Anarchy. Sons of Anarchy. That's right. BG. That's he bought. After Greg tweets out a picture of that Gordie Howe jersey that you recently bought, I want you guys to tweet out a picture of you wearing Madonna's coat, even though it might only fit over your forearm, but let's see it anyway. Uh, another one, Absolute says wide angle. Paul says wide angle, three hour episodes. Paul loves these things to last as long as possible. But uh, I don't know that we're going to go three hours. Okay, that's great. Thank you guys for the for the uh, the feedback. I think we're going to switch to the wide angle. I, I like the looks of it with the with the neon on the you know above and below. That looks pretty cool. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, so the next kind of topic, you know, I wanted to ask you kind of like to speak towards being because you're a collector, but you're also a vice president of product development for a card company, and I kind of wanted you to speak a bit about how do you reconcile those two aspects of your life. Uh, but I think you almost have. Do you want to just add anything more to that before we get on to the next topic, which will likely be our final topic? Well, like I mentioned before, my collection is a little different than a lot. You know, I, I know Brian collects more modern stuff. He loves, you know, and I, I love modern cards. I love the current cards, but the stuff that I make, the stuff that we make at Leaf. My collection is, like I said, 70s baseball sets I have. I have thousands and thousands of Sports Illustrated, Sporting News, so, I'm more of a nostalgic collector. I love the nostalgia. That's where my music is. That's where my collecting, that's where my heart is. But like I said, I've been doing this since I was 14. So I love cards. I just love the look of it. I love that I get to deal with it every day. I mean, it's, it, it's, I've had a dream job basically now for between Upper Deck, Leaf, and then my store 30 years. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's I mean, I've, this is what I've done. I mean, I think the only other, the only, the only real job, I a real job, I worked when I was 18, I worked at Target and I was an after school playground coach. That's it. Yeah. And I opened a store. So it's to me, it's I just love the old the hobby. The hobby is great. And that's why what's going on now is even is sensational because it's 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 bigger now. It's growing. It's gotten to the point now where outsiders are coming into it and and they're spending money and they're they're seeing what's going on in the hobby now. Maybe maybe they're lapsed collectors that have money now and they're seeing all the craziness. We're gonna we're gonna get to that. That is the final topic, is the state of the hobby right now, just to touch on that for a few minutes before we sign off for the night. But what I'm hearing in terms of being a collector while being a VP at, at Leaf is that 
there really is no crossover for you because what you collect versus what you produce at Leaf, there, there's no, there's no cross. You're not doing 70s baseball sets at Leaf. You're doing maybe some 70s players, but that's a bit different. So that's pretty cool. Right? Like it'd almost be like me. I, I collect all four sports: football the least, hockey the most, but I also collect baseball and basketball. It would almost be like me going to work for uh, Cryptozoic or uh, or whoever makes Magic the Gathering. It's like I don't collect it, but it's in the hobby still. So there wouldn't be the crossover, and there may not be any sort of real, I don't know, neat experiences that way. Or maybe right. I'd get into it. Who knows? So, okay, thanks for that. I just wanted to make sure we covered that because we had talked about it in preparation, and I just wanted to see if there's anything else that we missed. But let's move on to what I think is our last topic for the evening, which is really, you know, again, you work at a card company. You guys are a well-known card company. Um, you you have a good presence at all at, all, at, at the national, you have presence at the expo in Toronto. Um, so you have your, you know, you have your ear to the ground. You, you talk to collectors, you're, you're on the message board. So you're, you're aware of what's going on in the hobby right now. I think everybody is, I call it the state of the hobby. I mean, that's what Brian came on last Saturday to really do. I'm not so much of an address, but to discuss it. And we did for three hours. What, what's your what's your perspective on the state of the hobby? Why are these are all these cards selling for so much right now? What's what what do you think is the cause of it, and do you think it's sustainable? I think parts of it are sustainable. I think that there's you know look there's there's people that and I believe this started growing before the pandemic hit. I think it was it was already on that trajectory. Um, I think people are were looking for something to do different, maybe different place to invest their money. They were seeing some of the cards. It doesn't hurt when all of a sudden a card sells for a million dollars or 1.7 when I was in a case of a hockey, a, a basketball card sells for 1.8. People are see this and say, whoa, what's going on here? But I think it's also people that maybe have been lapsed and see what's going on in the industry now. Now, I know a lot of the stuff that's driving it is some of the Panini, you know, uh, and, and Tops Chrome and Panini Prism and stuff. But maybe these people are coming into the industry and saying, wow, these cards are beautiful now. It's not how I remember it. There is some value in this. It's different now. It's not your... 14 point thin cards that are in cardboard and these look these are crazy looking they're beautiful um and it's you know grading obviously helps uh to, to be able to you know for for the uh, psa 10 or a bgs 10 or 95 or whatever it is to drive up the value on a card that normally would be four dollars maybe um but i think there's new money and i think bring it in I don't, i'm not I never understood why people would be upset when there's more eyes on our hobby well, the, and let me just jump in. The reason people get upset is because the cards that they that they covet are now more expensive because there's more demand. I think that's why they get upset. I, and then I think they there, there's a sense among hobbyists, even you know some some lifers like I don't I don't share it, but many do. It's almost like whoa, this is our hobby. What are you doing coming in and changing it on us? But. I think that's a bit of it, but I'll let you continue sort of from where you were. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. But then you get the same people when when the hobby doesn't have these this new money. It's saying, oh, these cars, I love these cars, but there's no value in them. They're not going up. You know, it's yeah. you can't have it both ways. Um, either you want the industry to grow and become bigger or you, you just want it to be the smaller thing. And look, we've gone through web. People had to have been nervous about the industry a few years ago just because, you know, it wasn't growing. Now it's grown wilder than we ever could have imagined. And enjoy the ride. Look, my, my thing is I'm more concerned personally with how Leaf is doing. You know, I don't have cards that I, I, haven't, I haven't bought a card. I've never graded a card in my life. I want to see how good the, the, I love seeing the average collector, the consumer. I love hearing when Brian tells me um, Lumber Kings baseball, which was a surprise smash hit for us last year. The box are triple what their value is. To me, that worries me because, well, they weren't built to be $300 box. They were built to be, and that's how it is with Panini too, I'm sure. They're building products that are built to be 200, but now they're 800, 900. That's what worries me about the sustainability is. there's you, you can't get the value out of these. And that's not Panini's fault. They weren't built that way. These products are built with a certain price point and a certain content in mind. And all of a sudden with everything going on, all of a sudden these boxes are 10 times what they're supposed to be. That That's that's what worries me a little bit. Um, will that sustain? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think anyone really knows the answer. I and think we can all speculate on it. But we're ho I'm hoping it keeps going because the more money in the industry, the, the better for every company, the better for the hobby. I understand people get upset when the car, their normal, their 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 infrastructure is kind of screwed up now because what they normally can get, they're having trouble buying their player or their cars, and I get that. But you know, we've also know that this industry is very cyclical, and we don't know what it's going to be like in six months or a year. 
does some people does some of these people that have spent all this money this new money all of a sudden dump these cards back on the market do we we don't know that um yeah. and it's in the way it is now is a guy has a great game mookie bets his three home runs or dame Lillard goes for 61 points their cards go up 100 percent overnight it never used to be that way um are what's going to happen when some of these guys who pay there's an exorbitant amount of money for some of these guys these players don't turn out to be what they thought on michael porter and they start dumping cards in the market to get some of their money back. You know, it's almost like a stock. The stock market goes up every day and down. They're basing their value on these players based off their performances every day. It's almost like fantasy cards. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah fantasy cards. It's it's a little worrisome in that regard. Is that is it is it sustainable? I don't know. I, I've that's where Brian's better at that than I am because he he you know when he does his um, best of products, he's in he's he's involved. He's one of the key guys in this because he's doing all this purchasing and he's following this. My my personal thing is I'm I'm concerned with how Leaf is doing and what I could do for our products to get better. Um, and our products are getting better partly because of all this new money in the industry. We you know we certain products are going crazy and now um, Lumber Kings hockey is it, it was always popular but now because of how popular baseball was, everyone's asking for Lumber Kings hockey all of a sudden. So it's it's new people seeing our stuff because of that's the that's one of the trickle downs which is good for us. The people that are getting into the hobby that are getting it maybe for this investment purposes are starting to see some of our stuff and think, wow, Leaf makes some cool stuff or Panini makes some cool stuff. And they're noticing now. And that's where I'm hoping even if some of this stuff goes away a little bit, people stay because they enjoy what we enjoy. They enjoy what we're seeing. So they stay in the hobby. They say, you know what? Maybe not everything has to be an investment because a lot of things are right now. I mean, it's crazy how many times people are buying cars and they're going, you know, it's almost hard not to buy a car to make money. It's just not my thing. But I'm glad it's doing it. I, I hope it lasts forever because that means our industry is going to be strong forever. I, I, it's just you want an industry to it, it's it's strong. You want it to have blood going for years. I mean, I hate to use the term evergreen, but wouldn't that be great if we're always talking about how strong they are in three, four years is instead of saying, "Who man, industry is rough right now." It's great. Well, you know, I was having this discussion. I think on a, in some Facebook uh, thread today, but. I don't think the hobby has ever had a crash. You know, there, there, there's been adjustments, corrections, cycles, as you mentioned, but there's never really been a crash. Even after the early 90s, even after the, the, the mass production era, you know, those cards weren't ever worth much to start with. So they had they didn't have far to go down in value. Like, And just think of a Ken Griffey Jr. rookie as a real iconic card and one that symbolizes that era. I mean, that card was always around... 60 to 100 dollars and now in raw form it might be double that let's say in raw form it never really crashed in value so you know i don't think the, i don't think we've ever seen a crash i don't think we're gonna see a crash i think we're gonna see an adjustment or a correction eventually because all these all this new money coming in who is really investing slash gambling in active players young active players with very little uh experience under their belt those are the those are the investors that are gonna maybe be disenchanted when they see that when they go to unload. I'm not gonna use Luca as an example because I think he is special, but special. just just my, M, Michael Porter Jr. or someone like that. You know, if he doesn't continue to to be awesome, then those cards are gonna go down in value. Those people are gonna try and get out and and, and you know kind of minim, minimize their losses and maybe become disenchanted. But they came in with the idea under the guise of investing. And they, but they just invested in the wrong stuff. They more or less gambled or became a date and nothing wrong with day trading, but it became like a day trading activity versus a, a real investing activity. Yeah. Paul mentions bull bull. There's another one. Like if you're put, yeah, you got to get these guys before they double, triple or 10 X in value versus buying them when they go from, you know, $10 to a hundred, don't buy them at a hundred. Maybe you missed the boat on that. But again, what I'm trying to get at is that we will see an adjustment at some point. It's inevitable. But I don't think we're ever going to see a crash. We never have in this hobby, not that I can think of. And I mean, I've been in it for 40 years. And uh, and people that are putting money into the legends and the icons, the Jordans, Kobe's, LeBron's, Gretzky's, Lemieux's, Bobby Orr's, and you know all the Hall of Fame baseball players, even Mike Trout, you're not going to lose because these are true elite athletes that are at the top of their uh, at, of their profession. So. Those guys aren't going to come down in value. If you're if you're new in the hobby, putting a ton of money in, and you're investing, you got to be investing in good in good solid investments. Otherwise, 
you're like Carvin says, it's like you're buying penny stocks and hoping for the best, but they're not penny stocks if you're buying them at their inflated values after they have those big games. So like for me, Greg, I, I stay away from that stuff. I'm not buying any of these guys that are all of a sudden 10 times their value after two games like Damian Lillard. I should have bought Damian Lillard a month ago or two months ago, seeing his stats, seeing he was a top 10 scorer after the, over the past five or 10 years and then buying his cards, you know, hoping for this. But anyway, Carvin says, high, high, but, but Carvin makes a good point. High risk, high reward. If you get, yeah. And you're going to hit, you're going to hit once in a while. You're going to hit just like you once in a while you hit at the roulette wheel. But this isn't necessarily a new, I mean, it's a new, it's new in the way that cards now are so expensive, but at what point do people start really taking too big of a risk on guys like bowl bowl or Michael Porter jr. Or something like that, because the uh, superstar guys are starting to get up there in really high levels. And those, those are the guys that get hurt because they're buying a lot of these guys. Look throughout our industry who didn't, I could tell you stories about guys who bought thousands of Kevin Moss or yeah. Dave Fleming or guys like that, that, you know, but you didn't get crushed then because what were those costing you? A dollar 50 bucks. Yeah. Right. But now these guys are paying big money for these cards. And that's where it's different is you're right. There never really was a crash. I mean, after a couple of strikes, when I had my store, business was down. There's no question. Um, when you go through a baseball season, they don't have an all-star game like in the 94. Um, that was a rough year. Uh, when you have, you know, there's certain times. I'm sure hockey went through a couple of strikes, had a couple of rough stretches there. Crashes, no. But, you know, there was, look, there was a couple of times upper deck when there were strikes. We were a little nervous. Right. And those are, those are cycle. Those are natural cycles. But right. I guess, I, and those aren't, those aren't, when I, when I'm talking about a crash or an adjustment, I'm talking about in the values of the cards that are already out there on the market. I'm not necessarily talking about revenues at Upper Deck or revenues at Leaf or Panini or Tops or Don. Right. I'm not talking about or the car or the local card shops. It's bad for that. It's bad for those businesses, but the cards themselves don't really ever haven't really ever crashed, right? The, the Wayne Gretzky rookie card in it's like the Beckett value of $900. I don't know if it's still there or not, but it was at $900, I think, basically from 1995 until 2015, probably. It never moved in value because it didn't have to move. The, the Wayne Gretzky rookie card never really came down in value. Uh, a couple of comments coming in here. So let's see what we got. Carvin wants to say, buy blue chip cards. That's, Carvin and I think alike, that's my approach. Buy blue chip cards, you can't lose. But if you're going to buy, if you want to then, if you're tempted or you like a player and you want to gamble on a modern player, my recommendation in terms of an investment uh, advice would be, if you're going to spend $500 on a riskier player, take another 500 and put it into something that's kind of more blue chip, the, a guy who's retired hall of famer. Uh, so that, you know, you kind of, you're kind of hedging a little bit that way. Carlos says that's the trickle down effect of, of uh, fear of missing out FOMO people priced out are grasping at straws to hit on the next guy. You're like, great point. You know, I, I missed out on Damian Lillard. I missed out on Michael Porter Jr. Who's the next guy. But the good thing about that approach is that, you're taking a chance on the next guy. You're grasping at straws on the next guy who's likely not going to cost you as much because he's the next guy, not the now guy, right? right? Chris brings up one of my favorite guys to bring up is Todd Van Poppel because I was hoarding those back in 1990 from 1990 Upper Deck. I remember that very well. There's a good story about single game explosions and value. What about that guy that they did the next year? I think it was the 90, 91 Upper Deck. They did this kid out of some high school in New York that the Yankees signed Brian Taylor, Brian Taylor right? getting a With, fight in a bar and tore his shoulder up and, and he's done Brian Taylor. I mean, the guy was supposed to be the next big thing and right. he never, I don't think he ever really played, but boy, what a different era that was. Those cards cost a couple bucks and you know, you could buy 200 of them. Eh, if you go out, but man, you, you, you hit on the wrong guy. Now, now most people aren't hitting wrong because like, you know, carbon said, if you choose wisely, but, like the other gentleman said, if you start grasping and you start panicking and thinking, I want to get in this, and you go after the wrong guys, you can get hurt a little bit. And those people sometimes get frustrated and they move on. That's right. But you know what? The ones who are smart, who are the ones that will stay in the hobby, they won't move on because they will they will balance things out because they're hopefully smarter people approaching the hobby. It's funny. You know, we talk about Todd Van Poppel and Kevin Moss. Yeah, they didn't make it. But if you were paying more money for the better players at that time, Ken Griffey Jr., Frank Thomas... You're doing a okay right now with your with your holding. So, 
Uh, Brian Gray says, Brian Taylor bags groceries now for real. Nothing against people that work at the grocery stores, but hey, at least he's working for a living and too bad he's not sitting on 100 million in the bank like a lot of his uh, contemporaries are at this point. Ziggy pipes in and says, need to make educated choice and re educated choices and research. You should be researching next year's draft class now. Yeah, I mean, if you want to play that game of buying the next guy, research it so that at least you're minimizing your risk and you're not just going by what other people are telling you, what you're reading in headlines, what you're reading on message boards, on Twitter, on Facebook, on other YouTube channels. Do your research to minimize your downside so that you can actually know that, you know, this guy gets, you know, scored this many points in college on a consistent basis. This guy got along with his teammates. He was, a, he was easy to coach. Never overestimate or never underestimate the value of a player who is just a good person and someone that other people want to be around. I think that goes a long, long way because when you, you hear it all the time, when they do these draft combines and the players go through all the meetings, the top players in the draft go through all the meetings with the GMs and the coaches and the management and the scouts of the teams that are, you know, they're drafting. They always talk. You always hear them say he comes from a good family. He's got, he's got a good approach. He's mature for his age. He's disciplined. These are the things that they're looking for. I think those are the things we should be looking for because if they're like that, they're going to have a better chance of really achieving their potential and possibly even uh, surpassing it. I don't you know. know. Does, that make sense? Does that make sense to you, Greg? It's funny you mentioned that with character because I remember one of the best things about at that time working at Upper Deck was when I did football, we did the NFL rookie photo shoot. And you got to meet all the rookies, go on the field. And my first year there happened to be the rookie photo shoot of Ben Roethlisberger and Larry Fitzgerald and, you know, all these great, it was a great class. And sitting down and talking with Larry Fitzgerald, you think this guy is just a classy guy. He, if he's got the talent to match it, and he ended up being, he's a Hall of Fame player, obviously. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. You know, I wonder if people right now are worried about, because like I said, I don't worry about it because I'm not invested in it, but Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Not just because he's not hitting, but he's, every game he goes over five and gains five pounds. So is he going to eat himself out of the league? Is that a worry? Is he out enough character, enough discipline to change? Because right now, if you invested a lot in that guy two years ago when he was hitting the cover off the ball in Buffalo, um, and you're seeing him now, and he's just not having that impact, and he's going to end up being a DH if he keeps his body weight at it. What it is, or what happens? To, and that's where you know things change. Where all of a sudden, I don't know if his cards get dumped. Maybe a savvy collector finds someone who dumps his cards, buys them, and says, "This kid's still going to become great," and that it starts all over again. But that's where it makes me a little nervous because a guy like that was the biggest name two years ago, right? I mean, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And now he's obviously getting outplayed by Bo Bichette and Biggio's kid to some extent um, because he was never as hype. So that's where I think it's – his cards went so high. What are the, when it, when it, I always wondered when a card goes that high and he's not even in the league yet, what's the ceiling? Is it I mean, – obviously, I don't want to compare it to Trout, but if, this, if, if Guerrero ends up being a solid – not even as good as maybe Manny Machado. What happens the, the, to the, the what's the what's the if a card sells that high before he does anything, he ends up not being what they thought. I mean, look at so. Look, I, I'm not an investor, but based off what he's done the last week, I would be buying. He's probably too expensive, but Juan Soto is a beast. The guy's an absolute beast. He came back from COVID and he's hitting 420. He's hitting a home run every single game he's been back. I think almost. His cards have to be – the way the market is now, I bet you it's gone up every single day since. That's just the way the market is now. I'm sure it has. I'm sure it has. Okay, a couple of comments coming in, some really good ones here too. Ziggy says, Vlad Jr. is a great example. His father's name carried him. And I wonder how much of that did have to do with his father's name. I didn't follow him. I'm not a I, – I don't, I don't prospect. It's just not my thing. So – uh, I don't. I can't speak to it, but I wonder. I wonder if there's merit to that comment. Well, he raked. I mean, he, he he raked all through the minors. I mean, he was. I mean, he, I mean, people would talk about him as a, a sure shot. He could hit so well, but you can't judge just someone's character, and you can't judge someone's heart just because they hit great in the minors. When they get to major league pitching, is a different story. Yeah, yeah. Carlos says I was willing to give Vladdy Jr. time for his talent until I started contrasting him to Juan Soto, who seems to be taking his career more seriously. That taking his career more seriously. So based on that comment, and if I'm if I'm looking to put money into baseball right now, cards, I'm gonna follow that advice. I'm gonna go Soto over uh, Vladdy for sure. My, my favorite is Fernando Tatis Jr. I think he is going to end up being the best of all of them. That's my maybe Soto's obviously a beast, but he's got all the skill set. And yeah. his ninth home run tonight, I think. I just think he is the the, the real deal. 
Okay, well, great to know. Uh, Chris West says, beware of the hype. Yes, beware of the hype. And then Carvin made a comment earlier. He goes, the smarter investment is buying wax. You are buying the entire rookie class. Wax is always better than singles. For example, if Zion is a bust, you still have Jaw and others. I mean, there might be merit to that comment. For me, not interested. I don't. I have no interest in, in collecting wax. I want sealed wax. I'm assuming he means. Yeah, that's what he means. I, yeah. I want. I want the cards inside. I don't. I don't want the sealed wax. I do like unopened packs, vintage unopened packs, but that's a whole other thing. So. Um, but people do invest in wax. You hear it. Even some of these uh, these online analytical tools are now adding unopened wax along with single cards to the uh, cards that are part of their population. So, it's, uh, you know, good point, Carvin. Thanks for raising it. And there is definitely money to be made in that. I mean, all you have to do is look at Panini Prison Basketball from a couple of years ago. you got to be careful with sealed waxes if the key cards are redemptions. Right. All you be careful for that. 10 years and that redemption and, and all the, let's say in that particular product, all the uh, uh, Zion's or redemption or something like that. That's one thing that scares me about wax 10 years down the road as you pull the redemption. But I mean, he's right because look at the boxes now of some of these key boxes in the mid 2000s, the, the, the LeBron year, the Crosby year, the almost any year, the Durant year, you can go back any of these years and you can't touch those boxes. So yeah. he's not wrong in that regard, but the problem is those boxes are so expensive to start. Yeah, yeah, Ex exactly. And I mean, I agree. He's not wrong. If that, if you're just, looking to invest and that's it then pick the you know pick the right wax product to invest in buy a few cases if you can find it and sit on it for for a few years until you can get that you can actually sell it when you when when it hits your target price to dispose of it so great comments everybody really appreciate them so far a couple more ziggy says uh baseball cards can be huge money and risk i sold a jesus sanchez out of 25 autograph first first auto years ago haven't looked back Tatis Jr., you took the words right out of my mouth. I can't buy wax. I hear a voice that makes me open the boxes. A lot of people have that problem too. Carvin says 2006 Bowman Chrome Flatty Jr. also had Soto and Tat Tatiana Jr. Tatis Jr. I don't know. Okay. I think he means 16, right? He must mean 16. Yes, he means. They don't be retiring now. At the yeah. Chris West says ceiling wax is becoming pretty big on a forum. People started posting their collection. What do you mean they're sealing wax, like resealing wax? Or I don't know what he means by that. Tatis Jr., that's what I thought. Shaw Card says, isn't Vladdy the one who tossed his cards in a box while signing for tops? Heard about that. Yeah, sealed wax. Thank you, Chris. Sealed wax is becoming a pretty big on, on a forum, okay? Uh, Carlo says, if you ever want to laugh, compare Vladdy's 2016 card and 2016 Soto cards to what they look like now. They both change, but in different directions. Soto found the gym. Yeah, look at what they look like, he says, and Carvin says 2016. Yeah, okay. That's the end of the comments, so that's good. Um, we're two hours and uh, almost seven minutes here, Greg. I'm good to, to wrap it up. So I'm just gonna start by saying, first of all, Greg, thank you again for joining me. This has been a really fast two hours for me. I hope it was fast and enjoyable for you too. It's been a lot of fun, man. We covered a lot of topics. Had great interaction with the viewers. So viewers, everybody, thank you so much for joining. I think we're going to go to this new view, this new uh, screen setup here with the wide angles and the neon above and below. Uh, everybody seemed to vote for that earlier. So I think we'll do that. I'll mention this is the first episode ever that I streamed live on Twitter via Periscope. So if anyone was watching on Twitter, anyone besides Irving, I appreciate that. Let everyone know. Coming up on Wednesday, Ken Golden of Golden Auctions will be our guest. So that'll be exciting. I've talked about it many times, but we're going to talk about that Mike Trout super factor that ends next Saturday on his Golden Auctions. And then next Saturday is going to be Tony Sirianni, product manager at Upper Deck, will be joining. So we'll get kind of both uh, between this Saturday and next Saturday. We'll hear from two of the, the product, product guys at two of the card companies. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Absolute says, thanks for another great show. Thank you, Absolute. And thank you for reminding everybody to hit the thumbs up button, guys. Please hit the thumbs up button on YouTube. I do appreciate that. If you haven't subscribed yet, please consider it. Hoping to get to a thousand subscribers by the end of the month, if not sooner. And when that happens, I am going to open up a box of Upper Decks Goodwin Champions and give it all away to you. How we're going to do that, I don't know yet. If it's one person or multiple, we will see. Legion, thank you for joining. Paul, you are welcome. Thanks for joining. Carlos, thank you as always for joining. Ziggy, thank you as always for joining. And thank you for thanking Greg for sharing. That's really nice of you. Absolute. Time for bed, Tanner. Hit the thumbs up button. So again, Greg, parting words from you, my friend. Uh, enjoyed it. 
immensely. Uh, I'm sure you're going to have Brian on again at some point. Brian loves these things. Uh, just wanted to make a quick mention that um, so someone mentioned superlative sports that's coming out in two weeks. And I want people to start paying you know, our, our multi-sport line, which I, like I said before, we do, I think we own that category now. And um, we've got Lumber Kings baseball coming out in the game. You sports and the game. You talk, we got a big calendar coming out in about the next six months. So if anyone has questions, they want to send me a Twitter, Greg at leaf trading cards.com, anything you want. I'm always open. It's coming. I, I have it going on the ticker right now. You can follow Greg on Twitter at Scooby Cub. Follow Leaf at Leaf underscore cards and on Instagram at Leaf Trading Cards. Awesome stuff. Thank you, Ernie, for joining so much. Really appreciate it. Josh says, thanks for being a great guest, Greg. Who knows? Says, good to see you. Who knows? Says, good show, guys. Thank you for joining. Great to see you. All right, guys, until Wednesday, it's been a great evening. Thanks, everybody, for joining. We'll see you all again next Wednesday. Greg, stay right there, please. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody.